Hey, yo, what's good, what's good, what's good? Welcome to Reflections of a DJ, the road podcast presented by DJ City and Beat Source. I'm one of your hosts, DJ Crooked. We got DJ Never. Yo, yo, what up? We got Jamie the Great. Yep. We got a special guest. This man has been coming here for a few years now, a couple years now. <laughs> Several. <laughs> Several years now. <laughs> Several years. He's been like holding it down with Usher and killing it at the Usher show yeah. at Park MGM and then doing doing the pregame show, the opening mm-hmm. act. And the after party. And the after and, party. That's, that's how I met him. Yeah. <laughs> and on the record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I, I, I went to the show. I went to the Usher show. I don't know if y'all went. But, yo, know, his opening like his opening set was incredible. Thank you. Like, he had me standing up. Uh-huh. <laughs> and he's on you the mic. You know, DJs don't stand up. No, right now, nah, nah, not at all. <laughs> You'll be like, no, nah, no, nah, he's wacky. You're all right, you're yeah. all right, man. Like, I'll sit down, I'll sit down, I'll be like, oh, that was, that was yeah, cool. Yeah, that was cool, man, yeah. <laughs> now, he had me up, and I was like, yo, and he, like, transported me to the 2000s. <laughs> and he tra- and he just transported everybody to the 2000s. It was amazing, like mm-hmm. the 90s and 2000s. He just killed it, uh-huh. and I'm I'm very happy to have him here. We got DJ thank Mars you. in the building. What's yeah, good? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It was you. it was such an impressive set. I mean, I mean, I'm sure you've been tightening and mastering that opening set. <laughs> Pause Pause. Pause for a minute. Pause. <laughs> Jesus, I know, that, that was insane. <laughs> Just, oh, y'all are great. Mastering, I'm, tightening. No, no, no. <laughs> tightening. That I'm, opening. I'm, I'm complimenting. The opening, the tightening. What's up, man? No, no. <laughs> What's in this water? What, ha- what happened this weekend? <laughs> okay, no, we got to edit. No, don't make me edit this shit. No, man. no, it's fine. <laughs> this is too nasty. We're like two minutes in. Pause. <laughs> Yo, so, no, oh but it's God. such a great opening set. Thank and you. I think it's like, it gets everybody. I've never seen an opening set, an opening act get the crowd. Like everyone just stands up. I'm yeah. not even saying like, you know, a couple people vibing. Mm-hmm. Like everyone is like on turn on like level ten when he comes out. Mm-hmm. Like if I was Usher, I would pull Mars aside and be like, yo, <laughs> you're going too hard. Like, yo, <laughs> take it take it down a notch. Take it down two notches. I'd be man. like, yo, Mars, relax, all right? Relax. Maybe take that one song off for yourself. Relax. <laughs> no, but I'm I'm sure you've been I mean, you've mastered that. I mean it's it's amazing what you do. And you're doing that every night, right? Yeah, three nights a week. Wow. Um, in Vegas, Wednesday, typically Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday. Mm. So it's it's a naturally curated set, meaning I don't I don't plan right. Like I don't I don't have my records in a okay. Today's Monday the first. This is what I'm playing Monday the first situation. I don't I don't spin like that. I I spin off the vibe of the room, right? So you do. Yeah. So your room, your set is different every night. Primarily, a little bit. Uh, like, you, we, you know, there's some bangers you you you're going you gotta to play. Yeah, you're but not in the same it. order is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like right now it's kind of like I'm a victim of my set's success, and I'm not saying that in an arrogant way. I, yeah. I will totally explain what I'm talking about. Like, <laughs> like I've created like these viral moments, right? So mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. like I'll do a set, I'll say something like, "Yo, um, stop the music," be like, "Yo." How many of y'all partied in Atlanta in the 90s? Crowd go crazy. And I say something like, yo, you know, in the 90s in Atlanta, we had this big street party called Freak Nick. Everybody's going crazy. Mm, they, they, yeah. This is the age range that's relative to that movement, right? Mm-hmm. Then I'll do like my Miami bass set, right? So what I noticed what started to happen is those viral moments would travel the internet highways, internet, mm. you know, super highway. Mm-hmm. So then people would see me, either they would see me in Vegas, the day of or night of or whatever of the following show or they see me out in the world, yo, can you do that that freak nick set? Mm-hmm. Like so those moments became a part of people's expectations. Which is a good thing because it means that it one You're doing it's a good job. You, it's working. Yeah. And then two, it branded a moment. Um with a guy like Usher He's a branded moment that lasted <laughs> like 90s, 2000s, 2010s. Yeah. Now we're in the, he's literally been four on decades. top of his game for four decades. Yeah. It's like, awesome. and it's crazy because the kid is, I think he's 44. Let's say he's 44. But to say he's been in the space running running his space for four decades yeah that's in, that's incredible and he only looked 26 yo oh. I'm, so I'm trying to tell you <laughs> like he looks like a prize fighter Mars still calling him kid like I know right? <laughs> you know, I'm so, you know he's, he's, he's always gonna be that little kid <laughs> like singing thinking think of you all this time I think, think of, of you, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah you know <laughs> 
Yeah. But it's, you know what I mean? So, so, so I just try and create moments that are relative to, to the people in the audience. Um, I know where they come from, even if I don't know them personally. Mm-hmm. I know their experience because we've all been partying yeah, yeah. With, with them, with, with that age group. So I try and give it to them. Like I try and give, it, give them what they, they came to Vegas for a show. Yeah. We, we've all seen DJs. We've all either been DJing concerts or you go to concerts and there's a DJ playing and he's spinning. The music's not loud, so he's not really into it. Mm-hmm. Um, or he or she isn't that good, so they can't do what you just described. And I've seen y'all two get busy in, in a club, like secretly. <laughs> like, like I've been to parties out here in Vegas where yeah. you were rocking. Yeah. And actually, we were introduced um, to each other. It was, it was a while ago, random moment. I, I don't expect you to remember, but I'm saying that to say I've seen y'all rock, so y'all know what it is, and both of y'all do that. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> see y'all laugh. I mean, no, no, no. <laughs> see, see here it goes. I don't think y'all. I mean, but that wasn't no, a pause moment. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, no. No, but I mean, I mean, for for me, I thought it was the way you do it is very smart too. You get on the mic, you like kind of you research. So you're like, who's in here? Yeah. What city's in here? Mm-hmm. Is it is Atlanta? Oh, we got West Coast. We got Cali in the building. Mm-hmm. And you kind of hear the like the women or the people yelling. You're like, oh, okay, we got we Cali heavy tonight. <laughs> Cali heavy. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going yeah. there. Yeah, you're going there. And mm-hmm. then you get, and then you see the reactions. And you're like, oh, I'm gonna double down and go deeper. And I'm, mm-hmm. oh shit, I'm gonna hit the bay now. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, and then you're like, where's the bay area? And then you drop. You know, mm-hmm. it's just very smart the way he does it. Thank and you. he has a limited time to really kind of. How long are your sets usually? It. Um, about an hour and a half, sometimes two hours. Like, like I'll start. Oh, pre, at, is it that long? long? That's a while. That's a yeah. long set, man. It's a whole party. Yeah. <laughs> that's why yeah. by the time I see you, I mean, no you be like, that. yo, yo, you sometimes right? you be like, oh man, hold on for a second. I'm not ready to get on yet. I'm like, oh. give me a breather, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, I want to take a break, man. So, so doors open at seven. I start at seven. So, okay, we're all DJs in here, right? Yeah. So you know, sometimes like, like. Like you, ha- you will have an opener. Like you are the headliner. Sometimes I like to play like that. Sometimes, but sometimes I like to set the whole tone. Like, cause I feel like with music, if I can get you to listen to a record that you normally wouldn't party to, if I can get you to listen to that early, then that allows me to take you somewhere differently later on. Mm-hmm. So, just to give you an example, all right. A. Marie is one of my favorite female R&B artists, but not everybody plays A. Marie right, in a club. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But if I can get you to vibe to A. Marie, right, then I say, oh, yo, I can go somewhere else later on because mm-hmm. I didn't have to rely on the, the cheat code is Beyonce, right? Of course. I didn't yeah. have to rely on Beyonce to, to create a mood for you. Like, I, I can get you A. Marie. I can get you listening to Monica, I can get you listening to Sierra before we have to get to those records without having to rely on. We know the records that are going to work, yeah. but I mm-hmm. want you to zone in on those other records too. So, being able to, I'm the first one in that room, right? So I'm in here spinning. The audience is walking in. I can get you to zone in to where I want you to go. Versus, if I come in 30 minutes before he starts, then. All I'm left with is the bangers. That's kind of easy because you know you can literally just run and you know where yeah. it's going to take. But I want to set the tone, and I feel like that's that's part of the experience. That's mm-hmm. part of the Usher experience here is, or at least that's what I do with it is is set the tone so that you walk in, you're feeling good. Yo, I'm playing Tiana Taylor, so you you know what those records do to women and make mm-hmm. them feel sexy inside. And it's five girls. It's a girls' trip. They're from Detroit. They want to hear. They want to feel sexy. Those records will make them. Those records will get them in the mood before I have to go to the records that are just that you know going to work. Yeah, get yeah. The party going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Did you did you and Usher or like the, the camp get together and try to get like what you guys do in Atlanta to bring to Vegas? Because you guys fully took over Park MGM and made it a small <laughs> Atlanta in well, a way. That's his credit. Like. Usher's a visionary, and he knew what he was doing. So Atlanta's already ultra magnetic. Like it's it's magnetic. People want want to be there. They want to be a part of what it is. He said, "All right, I'm the king over here. Let me take all that energy and bring it over here." Like it, it was. It, he knew exactly before I even came on. He knew what he was doing. That's actually part of the theme. Is I brought 
Vegas to Atlanta. So to answer the question directly, that was something that he already had planted in his head. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was that was his plan anyway. So he, so then what he did was just put these pieces together that uh, complemented that plan. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean it, it works so well for the show. Perfect. Every, everything from the roller skates to the strip club to everything. Mm-hmm. That's know? all yeah. Atlanta. Like yeah. I can tell you, neighborhoods in Atlanta that have that energy. Like like South. When you, when you hear someone from Atlanta talk about the Swats, right? Yeah, there's big skating rinks in the Swats. There's a Cascade one. Is one of them, right? Boom. Um, um, you got Golden Glide. Do you have like you said Cascade? And then the strip clubs. The the bigger ones or the more popular ones are downtown. I mean, they're all over the place, but let's say Magic City, that's downtown. That's a whole nother energy, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the clubs that I play in in Atlanta, primarily downtown, Midtown, and Buckhead, that's a whole nother energy. So really what he's doing, he's tapping in to the different pieces of the A from the different parts of the city to put it on stage. That's right dope, man. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Did you guys think it would be this long of a run? Because it's, it's a pretty... Long fucking run. It's man. It's right? three years. Three it, years. It, it could go on for another three years too. Like mm. it, it, it could. All the shows are sold out. the The anticipation is through the roof. Yeah. Um, like they are literally are the master marketing tacticians. Did I say that word right? Probably not. Yes. Um, <laughs> like they know exactly well what enough. We well, know, well, 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 well enough to, <laughs> to get through the podcast. <laughs> we know where we <laughs> You know what I meant, right? <laughs> so, so like they they make a dope announcement and then add some more shows, right? So it's like everything for 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 him and his team is falling in place perfectly. Mm-hmm. So with the Super Bowl announcement, that that two more years worth of shows yeah. a- after that like and at the least, super bowl at least. is in vegas he's been he's been honing his skills in vegas for the last 3 years right. like mm-hmm. it, like you, god wrote that plan perfectly for him yeah, yeah perfectly man. It's uh, it's go ahead. Sorry. I was gonna ask, are you gonna be on stage with him? Hey man, you never know. Man. <laughs> you never know. That, I, I, I'm not being coy, but I don't know. I like don't that's know. a that's a creative that's a creative decision. Yeah, you mm-hmm. know what I mean. Mm-hmm. I feel wow. like he's he, it's gonna be. I don't know if it will be tough, but he's had so much hits, and he has to I think put that into nine to eleven minutes mm-hmm. or something like that for the Super Bowl halftime show. So just thinking of what might be missed and what might be in is kind of crazy. But, you know, the best best way to coordinate that is usually with a DJ. Mm-hmm. Hey, exactly. I second that emotion. Right? <laughs> I feel like a DJ is going to know how to build the energy up mm-hmm. in the beginning, mm-hmm. have an intro, and then just like kind of quick mix everything. Yeah. let And know which songs to let ride a little bit. Yeah. And then surprise them around here and then kind of end it real big. And, mm-hmm. then, you know, like he's going to, you know, hopefully you can collaborate with him and work on that shit. That That's way, what right? God's plan is for me. <laughs> we'll put that into prayer, my brother. Put it out there. But it's such a, it's such a like, like you said, it was almost like it was written, right? Because, yeah. Because him doing the shows out here, it became star studded the first year. People started coming out. Mm-hmm. He was getting more traction on social media. People were watching the recap videos, and they're like, "I got to go to that show." Mm-hmm. By the second year, he was buzzing so much. He got like I think he probably had the tiny desk performance. Yeah, that yeah. helped, that was which, which helped his catalog even more, yep. and created some viral moments with the with, you know with the, yeah. with the yeah. confessions yeah. joint. Yeah. Mm-hmm. you know, watch yep. this, watch this, all this shit became a meme. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then it just led up to like all these more star studded people coming to the shows, and then the Kiki Palmer thing. And uh, and that whole scandal, or and then all that happened, and then there was the Super Bowls. It was almost like a natural trajectory for he him. He was climbing them steps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's crazy. and it's crazy. He's done it with all his older catalog, and nothing really new from the past ten years that he's dropped. No, no, no. So, so, so you got you got to come to the show. Yeah, and keep it. he's like, playing it's, new shit. It's a it's oh, a he's mixture. Newer stuff. Yeah, no, oh, no. Nah, nah, he, he trust me. We tap. Every album is tapped into. Maybe I have to miss LA recordings and go you to the show. You gotta guys. come to the show. <laughs> yeah. hey, you, gotta you, know what, come. you know what song I forgot about? That, um, uh, Bender Than of Them Like Girl Bang Bang. What's that song? Um, uh, Good Kisser. Yeah, oh, yeah Good Kisser. Kisser. I forgot about that. I was like, oh, that's okay. in the show. Yeah. It's in yeah. the show. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, show. damn, that was, that was a, that was a joint. Yeah. That was yeah. a joint. But even that to his talent, like, he's making a Vegas viral show with, his songs that he dropped 20 plus years ago. Yeah. Like no new artist is doing anything close to that shit. I mean, in, in part because a testament to how great they're not making is. timeless music. Yeah. So, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like artists, artists today have figured out how to get popular, but they haven't figured out how to get classic. 
Mm-hmm. You, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, and we all, we all know we're all mm-hmm. in this space. Like, um, they haven't figured out how to get classic. Now, there's a couple of them. Obviously, Drake, he ain't going nowhere. Yeah, mm-hmm. Kendrick, he ain't going nowhere. On the hip hop side, J Cole isn't going anywhere. Um, there's a couple R and B cats who kind of do that as well. Yeah, but I feel like like today, and not to sound like the old guy in the room. I feel like today's artists, they know how to get popular. They just don't know how to get classic. And timeless. There's, yeah, yeah, course, there's, yeah, there's a there's a difference. <clears throat> Without naming artists' names, no, yeah, of course. I don't want to feel like we're throwing darts at them. Yeah. You know some of them aren't going to be around next year. They, they probably know it, but they figured out how to get popular. Yeah. They mastered that. Yeah. I mean, it is rare, though. I mean, Usher is a rare legacy act. No, very One rare. One of the last okay. ones. Bro, like a I'm, legacy act. we're playing Confessions. That came out when I was 12. <laughs> and that shit's popping off now, and I'm 34. Wow. So that's how crazy that trajectory. I mean, it's is. it's a bigger club hit now than yeah. it was when it came out. Yeah. Even uh, mm-hmm. Bad Girl, you dropped don't know, like that's just off top. Pop. Yeah, off, off top. top, like the one. He got records that are the go to record in your R and B set. Like, you know, like at the show, one of the biggest songs where everybody's singing it, and like the beat just goes out, and the, and the crowd is just singing it for like I don't know, probably like 16 bars Which or one? more is climax. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and it's like one of those songs. I was like, "Damn, I gotta start." Yeah, I haven't played. In a long I'm like, time. "Yo, I, that's the funny thing is, I'm at the show. I'm like, damn, I gotta start playing this or like find a way to like drop this Get somehow at the end of the night or something." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because they were singing that, and I was like, "Whoa, it was loud." Yeah. I know exactly. And I was like, "Yo, I've been sleeping on climax." Yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. But I mean, that is an amazing show. Yeah. I have a question though. Like, mm-hmm. when these celebs come in. There's, there's, it's communicated to you guys, right? A little bit? Sometimes. Sometimes. Some of those moments, like, like, like if Sweetie's there, you know, or you see her, or how does it well, work? Well, she's not hard to miss. <laughs> Put that out so, <laughs> where, where I'm positioned in the venue, um, you, I'm, yeah. I'm like, let's say I'm center, center mid venue looking at the stage. You're with the light, the lights and audio. The sort of. Uh, no, actually, there, there are three or four rows behind me. Okay, I'm okay, literally. Okay. In what would be considered like the VIP section, like to the oh, left, you in the crowd? The, yeah, I'm in the crowd. Oh, you're not even on stage. No, no, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the crowd. He's in the crowd, but he has like maybe the best view of the of whole everything. room. Yeah, yeah, bird's so you, eye view. You bird's eye. He audio. has like he has like the stage in front, sides. He has the, uh, the best view of the crowd. That's a crazy setup. Yeah. For DJ, it's the best. The perfect it's setup. The best. It's it's yeah. literally the Sensory, best setup. Yeah. So when celebs come in, unless unless they're Beyonce and you know who Beyonce is as right. soon as she walks in the room a lot of times I don't I don't know like so that that viral moment that popped off with um Patty LaBelle mm. I didn't know she was in the room at the at the time mm-hmm. um so I was just you know there's a portion of the show where I'm playing these certain records and I'm just doing what I'm doing normally right mm-hmm. yeah. and then like the next day Someone someone tagged me in the moment where she was. Let's say I was playing um, "Pony" by Genuine. It was mm-hmm. something like that, yeah. and I'm I'm playing the record, and she's singing along. You hear my voice in the background. That was a natural moment. Like that happened. I didn't do it because Patty Labelle. Because right. if if I was in my mind, maybe if I was thinking, how do I activate Patty Labelle? I don't know if I would have if I would have played "Pony." Yeah. <laughs> That's not on the. That's not on the. the <laughs> yeah. Why? Why? There would have been something in your head that said, "Is this appropriate?" <laughs> like Patty's in the building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yo, but I'm playing. I, a pony. I know exactly what you're saying. Sometimes, if you know who's in the room, you like you approach the night differently. Yeah, you know? to what I said earlier about um, not planning that you because when you don't plan, you get a natural. You know, reaction. It's mm. I didn't yeah. again. I didn't know she was there. One night, I'm playing before I let go by Beyonce. Beyonce's mom's is is in the spot. Mm. Someone sent me a video of her singing. Beyonce's mom singing before I let go while I'm spinning it. Like I didn't do it because she was there. I didn't know until the right then, until right. the next day. So like, so you wouldn't see Sweetie and be like, all right, let me drop some Sweetie shit or like that. <laughs> and shout her out on the mic. You you try to avoid that and just let it be what it is, right? It, well, it's not a, it's not like I tried to. It's just where I'm positioned in in the room. Like yeah. I, I don't know that they're there. Yeah. Um, sometimes now, sometimes I do, and, and and but by the time artists like that get there, you know. 
because they're artists, they don't want to be out there with the common folks. Some of them don't come to the venue until right before he walks on stage. Maybe they're talking to him backstage. I, I, I don't know, but sometimes they're not in the room during those moments. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then he'll know that they are there and he shouts them out mid show or whatever. And sometimes, you know, he'll, I may get a text from him, yo, so and so's here. Uh, when we do this part, cue up their record. I'm shouting them out. You play the record. Mm. Wow. Damn, that's crazy. How many How many people, like, come up to you and, like, have you gotten, like, more gigs or more offers? Like, people want your yeah. info? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, almost every night someone's coming up to you. Yeah, it's it's a blessing, man. It, <laughs> like, because yeah, you probably get a lot of people like, do you do weddings? <laughs> <laughs> Like yeah, <laughs> Yo, you'd be like, I don't know oh, if man, you can afford the, the shit. price is right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yo, man, weddings sometimes are hard. They're gigs, so hard, man. Right? Like yo, like <laughs> you, you know, again, we're a bunch of DJs in here. We've been there, like weddings, man. Like there's like three different crowds at a wedding, right? Mm -hmm. So right. you're doing a wedding, and and everybody, the conversation leading up to the wedding is, yo, I want, I want my joint to turn. I want it to be like the club, but you got fifty people, right? Yeah. 50 people, right? So let's let's just look at that number. You have 50 people. As soon as the food is eaten, 10 of those people are leaving, right? Because they only stayed that long. They stay, They want to see you get married, then they want to be fed. 10 of them are leaving, right? So you got 40. <laughs> 40 left. Of the 40, some of them are older, some of them are younger. The older people are only dancing to Before I Let Go in the Wobble. Like, as soon as you play them two records, they sit down. Like so going to some Motown. <laughs> yeah, but, but, like, it's like you know you got to put on the wobble, but as soon as you put it on, the as soon as you put it on, the song is over. You got to follow it up with, with a line dance song, right? You right. know you got to do that. Right. As At least in the, the black community. The cha -cha if you slide. don't, Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the cha-cha <laughs> slide don't mix with the wobble, I know. nor before I let go. So you, you, could gotta, candy, you could do candy, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> candy. Yeah. Yeah, true. But those three are the like boom, 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 dead giveaway, right? But then after that, them people, I've seen it. And then it looks like you're not doing what you're doing, but but because the audience is so isolated that they that they separate. And then the kids, they want you to hear, they don't want you to play future. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? So so then the kids ain't dancing to that because they don't want to dance with their auntie or whatever. They want to dance with the little high schoolers. And then you get the the bride's girlfriend who says now the bride is over there the girlfriend is over here girlfriend comes over and says yo the bride wants to hear some random record that you know is not going to work and if she's so demanding in front of you she's like the bride just told me now you saw the bride over here taking pictures with her grandmother she was nowhere near the, 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 the did this happen to you yes oh, <laughs> this, this, sound, this sounds so personal know, right? <laughs> yo who hurt you Mars details too no. No. She, she was over there she was over there <laughs> Yeah. I felt the trauma. This, yeah. Yo, Porn, I need to go see a therapist, man. <laughs> this shit was mad specific, right? Know, yep. this shit, he's still holding on to that shit, too. He's like, yeah, yo, as soon as I said what, he's like, yo, let me get this shit off my chest. He said, I feel better now. He <laughs> said the real DJ talk when he walked in. I was like, all right. <laughs> like, we, guys. we ain't breeding. We ain't talking about weddings no more. <laughs> we got about. Yeah, I, should, I, I should want to understand this topic, but you guys. Well, <laughs> I was shit. like, this sounds mad specific. That was a deep pain. Yo, yo, was like, yo, that was a lot of hurt. <laughs> he was yeah. over there, like, man. Ten people left. I didn't even start playing. <laughs> He's like counting. He's like, there's like 40 people left. God damn. I remember there were 17 people. <laughs> no, I feel you though. I mean, I get it. I'm sorry I cut no, you off. I'm no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. This shit is mad funny. <laughs> <laughs> he was going on, bro. So wait, you're, 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 you're I mean, you claim Atlanta, right? Uh -huh. You've been in Atlanta. Yeah. But you're from Massachusetts. From Springfield, Massachusetts, born and raised. Moved to, got to Atlanta. We'll use that word. Got to Atlanta. I can tell you the exact date. August 15th, 1991, um, freshman year at Clark Atlanta University. That's what drew me to Atlanta. Yeah. So when you were in Massachusetts, you learned to DJ? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm kind of curious. During that time in the, I don't know, probably late 80s? Early. Early 80s? Mm-hmm. 
What what was like the club? Like what was the party scene? How did you get into DJing? Like what was? Well, I wasn't the in the party like? <laughs> early eighties. No, no, I'm saying I was but, nine years old. <laughs> oh, no, 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 that's what, we're that's saying. what I'm saying. Like <laughs> late eighties though. Like with late eighties, you probably st- started getting into DJing, right? So so I, I bought my first record in 1982. It was Planet Rock. That was the first record I mm. ever bought. Um, I bought it very specifically to my uncle was going to the Marines, Army and Marines. Some family was throwing a barbecue at the house before he jetted, and Planet Rock was the big record of that moment. So I don't think I used the word DJ. I probably said, Uncle, Uncle, let me play the record. They they hired a DJ and I just wanted to play a song. Mm-hmm. So stole the money out of my mother's pocketbook, bought the record, <laughs> and played. pocketbook. <laughs> yeah. 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 Pocket <laughs> I, I did that a couple times. Yeah. I, I was like, <laughs> my mom still has a pocketbook. <laughs> I stole food stamps. And they know, and she knows, right? Yeah, she, she knows, knows you took that, that shit. Yeah, she knows where the money's at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Your yeah. Your dumbass is moving big. <laughs> she just came in my room, what'd you get? What'd yeah. you get? Some so, shit's missing. Yeah. That's, that's what started. So I remember I, the first three records, Planet Rock, Rocket by Herbie Hancock, and Sucker MCs. Those mm, are like, okay. that's wow. what my record Detroit? collection 82, 83, 84. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, one record a year. That's, yeah. Couldn't yeah. steal anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and then I bought my first turntables um in 88 so wait you're from springfield like mm-hmm. how far is, is like what what is that like and how different is it from boston how close are you or like, totally different totally different boston's on the on the coast yeah, yeah right literally on the coast we are what's considered western massachusetts total totally different zone like are nobody you? from springfield says they're from boston nobody from boston says mm. says they're from springfield like two totally different places wow I mean, still, you was like tapped into hip hop and yeah, heavy, over there. heavy, heavy, heavy. Crazy. Like, like we, um, we had everything when it, as soon as it happened. Like, we it wasn't like we were late. Like, like you know how some places got it late. Yeah, no, yeah. we got hip hop. Like, if it if it happened in New York on Saturday night, meaning if Red Alert played it or Molly played it, Magic played it, whatever. We got it on on Monday, literally, because someone uh, from Springfield was always going to New York. Oh shit! Every weekend, like that that was it, right? But then on top of that, we had dope college radio stations too. Mm. So back then, college radio was super aggressive, like with their programming. Like um, you would hear, you would hear for two hours, you would hear nothing but acid rock. Then you would hear a ska. Um, radio program. Wow. Then for two hours, you would hear nothing but hip hop. So, so I think that's probably why I know. You know, I grew up with a wide palette in terms of music that I listened to because mm. I literally grew up right next door to Springfield College, which is the where basketball was invented. Like literally, my the project I lived in was right here. Springfield College was right there. Right. So we had Springfield College. We listened to that station. We listened to WAIC. Then we listened to WTCC, which is another college station. Then we listened to WHUS, which is UConn's radio station. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we listened to WMUA, which was which is um, UMass. So we were sur- we're wow. Massachusetts. There's a gazillion college or yeah. New England. I say New oh, so England. Y'all t- you guys were tapped in then. T- yeah. Tapped in like when I, nothing got past us. So when I when I say nothing, like I listened to Ultra Magnetic before Criminal. I mean before Critical Beatdown dropped. Like I was tapped all the way in wow. to some real hip hop that most people who say that they're hip hop heads, even our or at least my age rather. I feel like we're all different ages here. Yeah, um, <laughs> wasn't tapped into like like so. I was listening to um, Ultra Mag when they were releasing singles before the album was yeah. introduced. So I, I'm being super expressive just to show you how long, yeah, yeah. you know what type of time it was back for me back then. And then so you went to Atlanta. You went to uh, Clark Atlanta University, mm-hmm. and like this is crazy. Who you went to school with in Atlanta? It's like nuts. It's like I was just telling them I was reading the 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 people that you went to school with and it reminded me of like it could be like a Netflix series. Yeah. <laughs> like it could just be like the college years at Clark uh Atlanta University like the 91 it's, 93. It, it's like BT College Hill mixed with like 
<laughs> with like Hulu Wu Tang <laughs> the story yeah. because they, I'm, I'm just gonna list a couple of people. Shaka Zulu, right? Ludacris's yes. manager. Yes. DJ Trauma. Yes. DJ. Me Ford. and Trauma were roommates for. You were roommates. Me and Trauma were roommates because we, I, we started out together. Yeah, because you guys were DJing parties, right? We were DJing in the cafeteria for seventy five dollars <laughs> split between three people. That's 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 what we were. Twenty five dollars a head. mundo. That's, that's decent money in college, though. That's Yo, decent like, money. In the nineties, that's too bad. In the nineties too. Yeah. Yo, it held me Gas down. was eighty eight cents. He was good. Yeah. We didn't have any. He had no car. <laughs> One of my favorite directors, music di- um, music video directors, and and the directors in general, uh, Brian Barber. Oh yep. shit! So I'm a, I'm gonna bust it down to you yeah. in the dorm. Right, because at that time there was only one male dorm, um, or one freshman male dorm. Mm-hmm. Trauma lived on the fourth floor. I lived on the second. Brian Barber lived on the first. Th- this is in one dorm, just in one place. One dorm. The talent. And if you don't know Brian Barber, he's made like, like I don't know, so many classic uh, music videos, like Hey Ya. Mm-hmm. He did basically almost every Outkast video. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey Ya, the way you move. Uh, he did almost every ludicrous video. Act yep. the fool. He did Oh Boy, Cameron. Mm-hmm. Uh, he did even Bow Wow, Let Me Hold You Down. He did so many. If you look up Brian Barber, yeah, it's like the his his list of of music videos is insane, crazy. And he really set the tone for like the two thousands music videos. How yep. they, like when you look at a two thousands music video, the high contrast, the bright colors. Him. That is Brian Barber. Him. Oh, so crazy. like I used to, I, I love music videos. I love the directors. And he was did one he of do, the Did he do Bombs Over Baghdad? Yes. Yeah, yeah, he did. Genius. Yeah. Gee, like That's he a, did one of the great, best videos. One, crazy. Yeah. Yeah. For more reasons than one. Yeah. 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 The strip club uh, bus was the greatest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember we're riding that shit like, God damn. The shit. Wait, so I'm not done though. You have Brian Michael Cox. Yep. Shout out to B. Cox. You went yep. to school with that Bobby Valentino. Yep. Brian and Brandon Casey from Jagged Edge. Yep. And DJ Drama. And DJ Sense. And Don Cannon. Oof. God like, damn, Cannon. You guys have to make a Netflix it, series about this. Like, hold the, on. I'm, it, it gets deeper. Prince Paul's son, P. For Real, who's a DJ. Yeah. Clark Atlanta University. Really? Spike Lee took all his communications classes at CAU. That, that's what made me choose CAU because growing up in, in the 80s, I'm a huge Spike Lee fan. So all his movies, uh, his early movies, um, clearly a fan of them, I knew he took his courses at Clark. He went to Morehouse, but he took his courses at Clark. To read from Arrested Development, at Clark. She was the first person that I personally knew that won a Grammy. So she's she's in school, leaves school, rest of development, pops off, comes back to school with a Grammy. What? Damn, man. <laughs> I you know, and what, what I it? love is that you guys like came up together and mm-hmm. you guys continue to work with each other yeah. throughout the yeah. years. Yeah. It's like when uh when I was wa- watching like the Bismarck Key documentary and they're talking mm-hmm. about Long Island mm-hmm. and you forget all of these amazing rappers that came out of Long Island. Oh, wow. yeah. yeah. And they were like very like unified. They like looked out for each other and they were cool with each other. Mm-hmm. But yeah. it's such a rare I feel like that's like me just that was such a rare time for the 90s that affected and impacted the 2000s. Do you and, know what I'm saying? And, and it, I mean, it still it still does. How yeah. I got on, put on to Usher, Shanti Das and Jaha Johnson, right? Shanti Das, former executive at LaFace. Jaha Johnson um, was her intern who was my roommate. So I remember one day so she crazy. comes to me and she says, yo, we got this new kid. He's kind of young, um, but we need to put a college style DJ with him on the road. Would you do it? And then so she pulls up to my apartment with Usher. Like at the time he's maybe 12, right? So she's like, yo, Puff A and R this album. We just need you to go on the road with him. That's how it started. But so I, I tell that story to say the AUC, not just Clark, Morris Brown, Clark, Morehouse, and Spellman, that was the breeding ground for for hip hop in Atlanta, right? Mm. So if you if you had a if you had an artist, right, let's say you were an executive at Def Jam, you got Red Man coming out and you wanted to break into the Atlanta market, you took him to the AUC, mm. right? Yeah. So so you took him on a Friday afternoon, you 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 loaded up the Def Jam van. You ha- you got Red Man and you got ten thousand CDs. You took him to all of the schools. You pass out all of the CDs. 
You walked them through campuses. Everybody saw them taking pictures or whatever. Mm-hmm. Then Friday night, you took them to the club. Now, you, you thought that list that you gave was impressive. So at the club, DJing, right? Little John. Little John. Mm-hmm. This, is, this is Little John when he had the Red Geo tracker and the megaphone, right? <laughs> This this is before he's signed to So So. Wait, Death. so the megaphone on his first album, it was not a just a thing to. No, no, like no. That, that's, he's that's, known for that. That's that was Little John. That, that was shit. that was Little that's John crazy. back then, right? So you got Little John. Then you wait. Got, what, what year is this? This is this could be anywhere between ninety one and let's say ninety four. So it, is this is this when maybe when he made like the Cableton remix? This is before. I that. was like in 97, 97, 98. My bad. Yeah, okay. This this, this, late, this is late before 90, that. Yeah. So DJing at the club, Little John. Then you got JC, one of the best club DJs ever come out of Atlanta, hmm. who was Ludacris's DJ at the time. You got him. You got him spinning right. Then hosting the parties, you got Kenny Burns. Now this is all Damn. at one time. Yeah, Kenny man. Burns, bro. This is this is at one. Legend. This is at one time. So. The the college, the energy that the colleges brought to Atlanta was so important because that's how that's how records got broke. Now you had your strip clubs, definitely super important. DJ Jelly, definitely super important, right? But if you have like a more mainstream artist, your marketing plan was to come to the AUC mm. because the AUC was a melting pot. Like because you had kids from Detroit, Chicago, St. Louis, right. Miami, New York, Massachusetts, mm-hmm. yeah. California. Northern California, Southern California, Texas, um, Chicago, all, all of that. So they would dump their music there, and then those kids would take the would take that music back home mm-hmm. and say, "Yo, I got this for free at Freaknik, or I got this for free at the Red Man Show." So the, the the AUC was the marketing plan for Atlanta because at the time, Atlanta radio, aside from college radio, Talib Shabazz and Randall Moore. For the most part, Atlanta radio was not playing hip hop on the radio. It wasn't even playing Outkast on the radio right. initially. Damn. Yeah, everyone was very anti hip hop back then. in the nineties. Yeah. yeah, that's why we had to listen to college radio, or like we we would hear hip hop like after midnight. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes late, late, late night. Yeah. Wow. What a what a time! Like, so I, I'm just trying to imagine you guys going to class, just being cool with each other, and then like slowly just seeing each other's talents, like kind of like each one has their craft that they're working on. Yeah. And I and I guess you and Trauma like linked up. Y'all started DJing with Little John, right? Sort of. Like we we, we were like we were blips on the radar. I'm just going to keep it re- like small blips. Like yeah. Little John was already made. Little John was throwing his own parties. You he, were in the cafeteria. We was we were in the <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was a graduation. Like we were we were in the dorm room. Like right. he had the fourth floor. I I had the second floor. We was in the dorm room back then, you know, everybody, you know, I'm the DJ and there's a rapper who live who 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 stayed in the room next to me. So I was a guy playing music and the MCs would come and rhyme like, um, you know, Friday, Saturday nights when we, because we weren't booked like that to keep it 100 with you. Little John was moving units. He had this party called OE and Chicken Jams, right? So it was old English and fried chicken. (laughs) 40 (laughs) ounces. That was a thing back in the nineties. That was a thing, and this is no forties and OE parties where they serve um, in the forties. Yeah, like that's it it was a dope college party. OEs and fried chicken (laughs) probably cost five dollars to get in, but he was the king of that space. Like, and he was a kid from Atlanta that played everything. John played reggae like he was from Jamaica. He played he played boot camp click like he was from Brooklyn. Then then he would play the Hard Boys like he's from the A because he's he's from Atlanta. So the Atlanta style of of like club rocking, though, like Little John's and what was the name you said that was like one of the dopest JC JC Mm. JC like Mm. that club style that kind of formed your style of DJing that. We hear now, like, nah. Like what formed the style that I hear now? That's at the Usher. That's at the Usher show. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would have to say I I come from the Kid Capri style of DJ, right? Okay. Yeah. Like like I come <clears throat> I come from that. Like listening. Where did where did you where did you hear that? How did you get influenced? Seeing the them tapes, just the, seeing them tapes, and seeing them live, like you know, from back in the day. Right. So I would say my. So we got different style of DJs. I'm what you would consider a party DJ, right? So a party rocker. Yeah. yeah so. Yeah. Capri, Clark Kent, SNS, Brucey B, and I'm sure I'm probably forgetting like some super OG. Those those are the dudes that that I 
you know, study. Um, Capri the most obviously because he was at the most. He was the most in in Bismarck on some level. Bismarck. Maybe Mr. But, C, Mr. C. Too. Nah, nah. nah I, you know what's funny? I only seen, I've only seen C live maybe once or twice, and it was like within the last five years. So yeah. I, I'm fully. Oh really? Blown. That's crazy. Yeah. So I, I couldn't definitely respect the C, but but the influences for me. Clark Kent and Capri. That's I definitely hear Capri. Yeah, I definitely, definitely hear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 it's. it's I come from the the uni, that university. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. I come from that school of party rocking, where like you're loud and vocal and present. Yeah, because when I heard you, I was like, this sound like an East Coast DJ. He All sound day. like a New York <laughs> DJ. He sound like a party rock in New York DJ. And that's why I was fucking with it. Like I was sitting down, I was moving, and a couple times I like I actually got up and I'm like, <laughs> I was and I took up my phone. I'm like, this is too good. I have to fucking, I got to take video of this shit, you know? Because I don't like taking video or doing social media. But like, mm-hmm. if something's really good, I'm like, yo, this shit is. I was like, I wonder where this motherfucker's from. <laughs> and then when I heard your story, I'm like, Massachusetts, Atlanta. I'm like, yeah. Did he pick something up in Atlanta? And then how how did the DJs in Atlanta sound? And did that influence you, or like you know, like how did they sound at that time? Was it just very? Because I've heard weird stories about Atlanta in the two thousands. Mm, so I, I'll yeah. answer the question, and I want you to tell me what you heard. So okay, because Atlanta is a melting pot. Like a DJ in Atlanta had to be able to play everything, right? So everything mm-hmm. is, let's say it's ninety five, right? So everything is. You had to know Miami bass. Mm-hmm. Then you had to know Atlanta bass. Two totally different things, right? Um, then you had to know the New York records. You had to be able to play reggae. You had to be able to play R and B. You had to be able to play house music, New York style house music and Chicago style house music. And you had to be able to play West Coast because all of those. Oh, oh I forgot. And go go. You had to. Wow. Like, like you could and not. Well, if you could, you just wouldn't be working. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, like you had to be able to play all of that because in one party, all of those people were represented. Atlanta's, Atlanta's a huge melting pot. Like, how New York is a melting pot, right? Mm-hmm. But Atlanta is a huge melting pot, and it's because of the colleges. The college is the magnet. The college is the thing that makes a kid from Oakland travel all the way to Atlanta to right. go to school. Right. So you had to represent, oh, oh, I forgot, Texas. You got to be able to play um, sure. that Texas flavor as well. And that's one DJ with six, seven different styles. Like, mm-hmm. And if you didn't, then there were certain clubs you just couldn't play. I was the DJ that was playing in those big clubs that everybody came to. Like I didn't just, I rarely played in like the, for lack of a better term, the neighborhood clubs. I I, I rarely played there. I how many played. crates? How many crates were you carrying a night? Back then, I was at least five. Psh, I'm uh, thinking seven, twelve. Yeah, seven, seven with with <laughs> Jesus with Christ. two bags. Wait, so so you're doing these clubs mm. and and you're you're mixing it all up. And mm. from what I heard in the 2000s, everything changed when Atlanta had like when they were dominating and their the Atlanta music scene started taking over. Like the crunk music was like popping, mm-hmm. and like snap music was popping. Mm-hmm. That's when everyone was telling me like, no one dances in Atlanta. And, and it didn't have much to do with the music. It was was it, it the was music? the street scene that that came in because. Was I- yeah, we'll, okay. we'll just say that. Oh, okay. I, want, I, ain't gonna, I ain't gonna get into. We'll just you we'll, say that. We'll believe that. We'll yeah, yeah. That. Okay. Mm. All right. <laughs> My fault. <laughs> I'm gonna. I love Atlanta and I love the culture, so I kind of know a little ins and outs. So yeah. Oh, so it was the street. It was a street scene. Take kind over. Of, it was a street scene, over. and then the big promoters at the time realized that they can make more money off sections than they could the dance floor. Mm. So mm. the big clubs. So they were catering to the street to the hustlers to and the street coming in. Yeah, to the person that was going to spend ten thousand on the section. That 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 person made the promoter say, "I don't care about the dance floor no more. I care about selling this section. I can sell a section. I can sell bottles. I can't sell. I can't sell alcohol to people if they're dancing." But well, I he's, al- he's also like fuck general admission, like because I'm I'm making yeah. quadruple the Did money. Did you DJ at bottles. Velvet Room or no? Yeah, hell yeah. Okay, so Vel- I don't know if you guys know what Velvet Room is, but it's literally like 
it's the tiniest dance floor for what it looked like, and it was just mad tables elevated, and then the DJ in this dead center. But it was all sectioned off. It was. So like, you're talking about Visions. I, so Visions was across the street from Velvet Room, but it owned by the same the same. Yeah, well, Velvet. Person. They were like in a little strip mall and shit. It looked. It looked so you're talking about the second one. Okay, <laughs> like, yo, the second one. We could we could break it down, but now what you what you're talking about the the time frame, um, the party scene changed. In, in, I don't know where you guys were in that in that time frame, but the party scene changed. It went from big dance floors and everybody coming yeah, to man. sweat. Um, DJ DJ Nabs used to have this spot called Kaya Old School Sundays on Kaya, and mm-hmm. that was one of the greatest parties ever in Atlanta, mm-hmm. um, where people would party like, and you were judged you would judge a DJ based on how well he kept that dance floor energized. It went from that to sections. In the sections, mm-hmm. you know, you you cater into the bottles, you cater into all of that energy. That's what killed. It wasn't the music; it was the focus on the section. So this is like early two thousands, right? Mid two thousand. Yeah, yeah. Let's say mid. Let's say mid. I would say mid because it was like that's when I started hearing Kid Capri, Enough, and all of these New York DJs. They would be on the radio, mm-hmm. or they'd be in interviews, and they'd be like. Yo, man, I don't know what it is. Motherfuckers ain't dancing no more. So you say mid, then, you mean 2010? Whenever like, Young no, no, like came mid out, if you That's what I'm saying, um, early 2000s, yeah. So like, I, yeah. I would hear like these, more, like all these like, you know, like the big dog DJs that would do yeah. like the, the big hip hop joints. Yeah. They're like, no, man, this shit is whack now. No, nobody's dancing no more. And they kept yeah. saying nobody's dancing no more. And then they kept kind of talking about Atlanta. Like Atlanta's the worst, bro. Like, like no one's dancing in fucking Atlanta. Mm-hmm. So like, now know. the ill thing about that is, and wait, wait, but I also heard the crunk music was a problem because it was like women didn't weren't on the dance floor no more. It was a bunch of dudes getting crunk and wilding the fuck out. I mean, think about nuck if you <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, So it was like those records that Even came Diamond on was swinging at people, and so never, they were like never scared. Or something. Yeah. So they were like, <laughs> so like women wouldn't dance no more. It would be like just all the dudes wilding out. You know what I'm saying? Just like. Just I'm not moshing, to, but just like you know. To answer that up. question yeah. um, a little bit more directly, some of those DJs aren't good, right? <laughs> okay. So Woo. some of some of them, and I'm not saying this from a disrespectful yeah, place, because yeah. clearly my style of DJing was born in New York City. Right. Some of those DJs weren't. They just they weren't good. They weren't going to get it. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't think they got it either. Like, and sometimes. at the time, they were biased against. Atlanta music, right? So you got a DJ from New York. The smart ones, Bismarck, rest in peace, was a smart one, right? So when I say smart one, what Biz would do is he would come to town. Yo, Mars, I'm I'm spinning at the warehouse. What's tell me all the new Atlanta records? I would meet him at the record store. He would buy all of them, right? That way he had them in his crates. Or if if the records were outdated or they weren't being printed anymore, mm. I had three copies of your biz, here's one. He would borrow them from me, from Doc, from Trauma. Did he ever JC. give it back to you? Or? Hell no. Nah, bro. He did the same, did the same thing to me, but. <laughs> Yo, see, see how that was personal with him? Trauma. See, see, see? See, this is therapy. But it's so, biz though, man. That's so some DJs, some DJs, biz was not biased, right? Some New York DJs, and I know because I spun with them. They acted like, yo, I don't need to know that. So they, they would come and, and, and stink up the place. Yeah, yeah. And, and some of them weren't good party DJs anyway. They just happened to be from New York. With that's what, that, that's yeah. what I figured is that they would come, they would come <laughs> to New York New and they would do their New York shit and then be like, oh, y'all motherfuckers are whack. Yeah. yeah. And they're you know stuck in their way. So they're just like, Yeah, ah. yeah. So that's, that's the truth. Now, now Capri... Superstar, he's always gonna rock. Right. When Capri comes to Atlanta, the Kid Capri audience comes to see him. I mean, he's a he's a god. You, you know what I'm saying? So, but some guys, and respectfully, I, I'm not gonna name any names. Some guys didn't do their homework, and they weren't that good anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but there, there was a turning point in New York radio because there were some DJs in New York that were like, "I'm not fucking with this Laffy Taffy franchise boys kind of shit." Yeah, or, or my YT kind of shit. Yeah, but, see, but then those yeah, are the we love that, that shit in you know, LA, bro. Yeah. So in LA, we were loving they, that shit. They, they missed the boat now. So the funny thing is, Nuck If You Buck was a high school record. DJ Scream was one of the DJs that broke that record, mm-hmm. right? Nuck If You Buck started on the east side, and it was like a record that, that Scrappy and them, Trivial, they, them kids were in high school. So football games um, 
are big in the South, yeah. right? So imagine you got two rival schools playing and that's the song, that's the anthem of the moment, right? So mm -hmm. all those high school kids, that would be their song. They was definitely dancing to that mm -hmm. to that record. Yeah, because like, I, I remember someone said Diamond was like 16, 15 doing that, cutting that record out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like that was, though. and the funny thing is, um, those records, for the most part, had dances associated with them. So, so people were definitely dancing to to that, like the whole snap, like yeah. all of that. All yeah. that came from now. Snap and crunk is two different things. It, crunk is a little bit more violent, <laughs> so to <Aggressive>. speak. <laughs> crunk is like Onyx, yeah, Onyx, <laughs> and Snap is somebody else, Kwame. The I don't know, the Robo. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's 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 two totally different things. Then they really come from two different parts of Atlanta. Um, Crunk is is East Side. Snap is West Side. Mm. Born out of the strip clubs, mm -hmm. you know, the pool palace off of Bankhead. But I they, I, I never heard that really. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Two totally. Two totally different sounds. Right. Two totally different sides of the city. One represented. I would say this is just my opinion. Snap was high school football, Friday night lights energy. Snap was, I mean, crunk, that's what crunk was. Snap was strip club, fun stripper music from the, from the West Side. Mm. That, that, that makes it kind of sense. <laughs> And that it makes a, a lot of sense, bit, yeah. Bit, yeah. Because like, when when snap music got to LA, it was the biggest thing in high school. Mm. It was the biggest records at the dance at the high school dances, and and crunk was, but it was banned because people would fight. See, 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 see yeah. but like New York, like embraced crunk first. I think. Well, it was probably the. Sh it came crunk. out first. It, it came out first. They embraced that shit. I think. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we had Jermaine Dupree on, mm -hmm. and he was absolutely right. Like Young Blood's Dam was the first, mm -hmm. like kind of Atlanta down south record, crunk record, and never yeah. that was crossed right. over. Mm -hmm. We were playing yeah. that shit, yep. and then we started falling in love with like Little Scrappy, mm -hmm. like Little Scrappy, no problems. Got money yeah. Was yeah. like we, I remember seeing the video for that. And I was just like, yo, these Atlanta motherfuckers ain't fucking around. Like, that reminded me, that little scrappy no problems video reminded me of the DMX get at me dog video. Mm. When, when he, he was in the, the tunnel. tunnel. Yeah. Mm. It was like dramatic. Yeah. Because yeah. the way Little John was was walking in with the club and mm -hmm. the, the way it was like, it was like, yo, he was walking in like the tunnel like in that. Atlanta. So yeah. if you, if you, think I even about get goosebumps it. thinking about that shit. Like when I saw it, I was like, and the way the pianos and the bass was just dropping, I was like, this shit is. Mm -hmm. John no put um, Big Cap on the Be a Be a remix, right? That was intentional. That, that was, was another get, huge record. Yeah. That was to yeah. get New York to pay attention right. to, to records in the South, right? So um, I think, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly, I think Jada Kiss was on it. Um, they filmed that video at the bounce. Mm -hmm. Right on the on the west side. That's right, that's right. Um, and, and so John, being a DJ who travels, he knows what he had to do. You know, put put big cap on the hook um, at the top of the record to make sure to give New York a, re a reason to pay attention right. to to that. Right. So the smart guys in New York paid attention, and then they benefited off of it. Right. So I feel like Dipset paid attention. If you listen to yeah. Dipset, like like. The early stuff, they were smart because they, they would be in Atlanta a, a lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. um, they they were paying attention. Drake would be in Atlanta a lot, a mm -hmm. lot. So some guy, and not, not that Drake's a New Yorker, but I'm just saying rappers who were paying attention and, and they weren't stuck. Jada Kiss paid attention a lot, a lot. So some guys got it, some people didn't. I mean, and, even YG was in Atlanta for a while, mm -hmm. so he got it. Now, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm trying to think what was the first like real crossover down south record because when he mentioned B.I., I'm thinking I Don't Give a Fuck was maybe one of the first ones that mm -hmm. that hit New York first. Mm -hmm. It didn't hit as hard as Young Blood's Damn, yeah. but that was one of the joints. I remember we Damn would hit and then we'd be like, Let's play. I don't give a fuck. And if they <laughs> if they really fuck with I don't little John. I don't give a fuck. Mm -hmm. Then we would go into bi bi. Yeah, That's yeah. Like, you but know, it, it was like that was the thing. Like the setup. That you was the what? setup. One of the first New York artists to fuck with Lil John I remember was Fat Joe. 
Fat Joe. Play no games. The goat. Mm-hmm. Play no games. Yeah. Wow. That was like the first time I ever heard of Lil John. I was Where? like, he got Fat Joe in this? It was like, oh shit, all right. And you know well, what? Cableton, he did the Cableton tour I mean, remix. I know that was big. But it's so y'all. funny about that. Nobody knew that was Lil John until Lil John was, until, was blew up. They was like, oh yeah, he did that remix. Well, when we, we saw it, we, I automatically thought it was like, oh, that was a New York DJ that did it. I thought it was like <laughs> a Salam right? Vimi. Yeah, yeah, Salam Vimi. And it was like Lil John. So we just like, oh, you just thought it was somebody that you just. like some new dance hall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that must be like a new DJ in, in Brooklyn or something that's yeah. coming up. Yeah, then, I get it. Yeah. I, I get it. I get you it. You know what's funny? During this time, West Coast didn't have no artists and no music scene, so we were just... Now, y'all did. What are you talking about? Y'all Not in the early 2000s. <sighs> who did we have? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so, damn, who did y'all have? You know, yeah, you know what? Exactly. To, to be honest with you, <laughs> if you're talking about early 2000s, late 90s, Exhibit was big. Yeah, he Exhibit. was. It was that, like that, it was that, like Drake exhibit, and exhibit. exhibit and Nate Dog were the only yeah, ones. It's had, Ice Cube. Um, the Chronic 2001. That's yeah, 99. But like That's they, 99. Especially on some underground hip hop shit, Exhibit was killing it. Yeah. yeah. Like but, he had these but like underground one records. One artist is yeah. not going to make a whole coke. He just didn't make party records. Nah. That, that was but, but, but he was a dope MC. We were MC. spoiled because we were spoiled because New York was on they had Dipset, they had Fat Joe coming out, Ja mm. Rule, Fifty Cent. And then the South had all this fucking but you not, know, young but, blood. But nah, but when you had like Bitch Please, that was a huge New York record. <laughs> yeah, dude, yeah. that's in the nineties. And, and we mm-hmm. and we loved Exhibit. We yeah, were like, exactly. That's ninety nine yeah. though. We didn't have nothing in the two thousands. So you say it specifically in the two thousands. Early two thousands, we you, don't to the game, we didn't the have game. anything. Yeah. Yeah, and no- that's in 2005. Yeah, Nocturnal, right? What was that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, like, hey, yo, I thought that was your man's being like, I thought that was your man's. You tried to play Fucked it. Up. Yeah, Nocturnal. Super ugly. Know, yeah. <laughs> we didn't have anything. That was a huge record in New York. Oh, was my God. That was Nocturnal. Huge, that was a huge ret- record because fucking Jay-Z made the diss with that same beat. No, 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 no. Before, no. before, before the before. diss. That's you know why what? he made That's why he used that beat. Mm. Because Super Nocturnal, ugly, yeah. Super Ugly. What was the name of that song? I don't know. For no, for no watch. I know it was the movie to watch. Yeah, mm. but that that was getting yeah. played so much in New York. Bad intentions. Bad intentions. Bad intentions. That's what it was. Yeah. But yeah. but the the superheroes that y'all had was so damn big. Like like, I mean, the whole Death Row was. That's in the nineties. That, yeah, I mean, I get it. It's in the nineties, but they never it never subsided. It yeah, but never Snoop, subsided. Snoop was still dropping shit. In but the yeah, Snoop, yeah. Then, but then Snoop was, went to New Orleans. Because he True. was no limit. Yeah, he was still, he was still, he still making the West Coast. And then yeah. Dr. Dre was just hanging out with Eminem, and that's Detroit. So we really... You I, just want to say that the game brought <laughs> L.A. Oh, back. He did, definitely back. did. But I'm saying we were... <laughs> that's what he want to say. Meanwhile, you guys are fighting. We were spoiled with such great music coming out from both of the East Coast and the South. Like, yeah. You guys are... Man, even Texas was giving... Paul Wall, Mike yeah, Jones. Yeah. Oh, man. It was such a great fucking time. For, we were just indulging... I, I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Yeah, Cypress Hill. <laughs> 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 hey, now, I love Cypress Hill, but he's being disrespectful. Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. That's a reach. <laughs> Insane to the member was past 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, that was 91. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's weird. Like, Cypress Hill was, like, such, like, an underground hip-hop... Album, the first album was loved by all cultures. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Then somewhere by the second album, they just became like a completely different group. Mm-hmm. Like they became accepted by a completely different audience. Audience. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. it's really kind of weird though. They're still touring though. That's the yeah, thing. Yeah, no, they yeah. are. They, they, they found an audience that won't let them go, which is dope for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah like, it's a cult. It, it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so it's a cult. I like, think it's a testament to like how far like weed and marijuana culture goes. <laughs> how far? Because... The, because they represented weed and marijuana culture so much, I feel like they cross over to a kinda wider like, audience. Kind of like the Grateful Dead type yeah. of audience. Yeah. Yeah. That's a perfect example. They're like the Grateful Dead of hip-hop. Yeah, yeah they really you know are. what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, they have their own dispenser now. Yeah. Dr. Green Thumb. They like, better. Yeah. <laughs> as much as they promote <laughs> weed. They were just doing the reggae fest out here over the weekend. Yeah, they were right. headlining, yeah. Yeah. yeah so... So I want to go back to like your your college hill like uh, college hill <laughs> your, your, your Hulu Wu Tang era mm. which you guys should make a Netflix series on. There's just too much talent that came too much too much. I think it'll be so fascinating to see mm-hmm. everything that was going on in Atlanta and then all these stories kind of emerging. But anyway, I want to go back there because Shaka Zulu right Ludacris's manager yep. worked for the station. And he put you on, he like he hooked you and Trauma on the radio, right? Was that the story? Yeah, I'm gonna tell you this. Yeah, right. My first, even before 107, it was, 90, it was 97.5 at the time. Even before 97.5, Shaki on Fridays used to have this show called um, the Sound Room, and it was 
Shaka Zulu, B Nut, and Tasha Love, mm-hmm. me and Trauma were were the DJs, right? So remember I told you artists would come to Atlanta, they would take them to to the AUC and they would, you know, hang around, pass out merch and t shirts and, and CDs and whatnot, tapes at the time. Then those same artists would go to Shaka's show. Mm-hmm. Right. And then from Shaka's show we would hop in the car, everybody would go to the warehouse. So that's that's how that was. Then Shaka um when ninety six I believe it was when Hot ninety seven five started and um Shaka was in the programming department the 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 Friday night show now listen to this Friday night show that he put me on at the time it was Chris Lover Lover obviously Ludacris Lala who's Lala Anthony Carmelo's Anthony's wife right. mm-hmm. and then me I'm the DJ on Friday night so mm-hmm. but this is uh, this play is put together by Sean Taylor and Shaka Zulu right so so I'm I'm explaining that to say like this guy Shaka had he was a visionary mm-hmm. Chris Lover Lover me and Lala Anthony on one radio show wait yeah. Chris Lover Lover is ludicrous yes Mm-hmm. And he's the host of this radio show, Future Flavors. On on it was and, and, and Poon Daddy, who who was Poon. So Chris and Poon were the were the talent, right? It, Chris Poon and Lala, me and me and Poon, who's an LA cat. Me and Poon had classes together at Clark. He was a communications major. So to the point that you were expressing earlier, everybody kind of is like this dope ass community intertwined. That's it was. It, it was intertwined, and that's what it was. That's what the energy was. But that particular play was spearheaded by Shaka. Mm. I'm, I'm, he's one of the people I'm in debt to forever. Was Luda always a rapper, or he became after? Always. He always was. Oh. He, he, he always he was. He understood like like the reason why he was part of the reason why he's so successful, he understood what a rapper's relationship should be with radio because he came from radio. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, like you know what I'm saying? Like, he understood it better. Like, so he would do interviews better because he was used to interviewing people. Yeah. He would, you know what I mean? He would present himself better because he saw all the marketing firsthand because they <clears throat> would come to him to pitch him to play records. Like, so he was literally, he went to Georgia State, but he was in, I call it the, uh, music business university before he became a public artist. So he had an advantage that a lot of rappers didn't Damn, have. That's mm-hmm. all, all orchestrated Shaka Zulu, which what, is nuts. What were some of the first records that Luda dropped that like was kind of bubbling in Atlanta? Like fantasy, fantasy, fantasy. That was the big one. That 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 was. I remember the so day. literally. That's the one of the first records he recorded, and he dropped it, and it was a hit. That one hit. <laughs> like yo, did so he, was a did star. He, did he play it for you before he dropped it? And kind of give. Mm-hmm. Of course, of course. I, I was on the show. Like, like remember when the Source Awards were, were popping off in LA? Um, Source Awards and BET Awards. Well, I was one of the. Me and Chris were always the two that were flown out by way of the Source Awards to to LA to represent the station. Mm-hmm. Um, so I like one. I was on the show with him, but we was always around each other. So I heard his music before it came out. So I knew what it was gonna be. Like I knew what it was. I was with him the day at the Source Awards. It was me, him, and Tigger. This is when he oh, big Tigger, he, he was, big Tigger he was, he was big no longer Chris Lover Lover. He turned into Ludacris. So you guys were probably there as DJs. Um, Def Jam was having a listening party at SIR, right? I think on Santa Monica, right? Chris didn't know what was about to happen. I know he didn't because I was with him all day. So he had just got signed to Def Jam. We walk into the listening party, and they, as we're walking in, they had no idea he was. He, they knew he was coming, but they didn't know when he was coming. Walk in, they're playing his record for all the DJs. So his DJs from all over the country. And Kevin Lyles is talking, giving a speech. Ludacris walks in. Now remember, I told you we came in together. We stayed. We took the same flight. We stay in the same hotel. The minute he walked in, I didn't see him no more for the rest of the weekend. Oof, like I'm popping now. It, 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 no, they grabbed him, took oh. him, and said, "Yo, you're from here on out. You're you're Chris Lover, Lover. Like he, let's say I'm making this part up because I don't know. It. Let's say he got signed on Monday. Uh, Source Awards was Friday. When he walked in, played that record. The record obviously is a hit from gate from the gate. Yeah. When he walked in, his career changed. 
I don't. He may have quit that day. I, I don't remember because I, I literally did not see him. <laughs> yeah, I did not see him. My two weeks. I was, I was literally going to ask you at what point did he like phase out the radio? It was that so time. It may it have been that day. That, that day. That minute he walked in. Was that? Was, it was like only one flight back to Atlanta. Know, yeah. It was Mars back to Atlanta. <laughs> and I'm sorry. <laughs> Sitting there, man, yeah. lonely. He was, he was an empty chair, and I was like, "Damn, I got in her wiggle room now." Yeah, the, the fucking radio station was like, "Yo, where the fuck is Chris?" He's like, he just stayed there. <laughs> yeah, Yo, he came back. Y'all, chair, y'all need to get a new host. I don't even know where he's at. <laughs> Yo, you might want to make Lala the first. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mike. Yo, it happened you, that fast. It huh? happened that I saw. He walked in as Chris. And I don't, he walked out as ludicrous. ludicrous. I did not see him for the rest of the weekend. <laughs> like he was, they had, you, you know, you, you know those big weekends, you know, there's party here, party yeah, yeah. here. Uh-huh. At, when he walked in, he was signed, signed he was a Dev Jam artist. <laughs> and the funny thing is, he they didn't even invite him as an artist. He They invited him as a DJ. But, I mean, yeah, as a, as a radio DJ, but they would just happen to be playing his records when we walked in. Mm-hmm. It was a wrap. He walked in. He yeah. got pulled. He got pulled into the Illuminati room. Yeah. <laughs> <He> said, <laughs> and it was Mar- a wrap. Mar- 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 <laughs> ready for him to sign. Mars is like, I'm with him. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Yo, you know that uh, big yeah, bodyguard yeah. at the door that just puts his hand on you? <laughs> not today, buddy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's, That's crazy. Did he, ever, <laughs> did he ever play you a song? You're like, this ain't it. And then pff, it like blew up? Nah. Um, it, n- nah. Because it seemed like every single he put out was a hit. That first album was like kind of crazy. Yeah. Fantasy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like those first two albums were crazy. Even Act yeah. the Fool now. Like <laughs> yeah. everything popped off. Yeah, he had like a Fetty Wap run. Like where like, for like every six, single, seven years. He had though. a longer run than yeah, Fetty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, long. <laughs> but I'm just saying he had That's like. That's disrespectful. Yeah, no, 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 oh, no. no, Fetty had a good run. I'm trying to say he had. <laughs> He had a good four to five singles. We were running in the club, like back to back, yeah. just like at one time. Stand season. up, yeah, yeah. shit was crazy. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking like southern southern hospitality. Yeah, Saturday, uh, she's Saturday. the whole, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, like she whole was crazy. Oh man, joints. Yeah, jo- and then he was on big R and B records, which helped him cross over right. into other spaces. So DTP was doing smart stuff, and then DTP gave birth to um, Titty Boy, which is Two Chains and Chinky. Yep. And Ch- yeah, it's Chingy. Chingy was DTP. Yep. Yeah. So right. good talent coming out. A lot, a lot of, lot of energy. So we did when Ludacris disappeared. Did Shaka Zulu disappear as well? When nah, Shaka is always other people. He's always I, like I, I, I lie to you not. Like that's not even a cliche. He's always, he's probably got a gazillion trillion dollars. Same person. So kid wow. trying to chicken spot, bro. Yeah, like he same 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 person. So wait, you DJed for Usher around this time or a little bit before this? First album. That's first when, album. that's when we started to go on the road. First album. And then did you, you never DJed for Ludacris? No, no, no. Uh, no. Mm-hmm. And then you were DJing for other artists, mm-hmm. and you were still in contact with Usher. Yeah, and he was probably working on his next album, and then he was like, "Yeah, I want to go on tour," and then. You just gone on tour for every album, pretty. No, much? no. So it was it was the first album. So first album came out in ninety three, ninety four, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then after that run, I, it was only a semester's worth of shows that I did with him. How was the shows? Simple. It was that tape. You know, it was a dad tape. Yeah, it's simple. He, you know, they didn't invest in the show because he was a new artist. You, you guys know how, yeah. how that was. You know, and plus he was like 14, 15 years yeah, old. Yeah, yeah. So, like, what was the crowd? It's just like a bunch of teenagers and, mm-hmm. and little kids. College shows, probably. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then the the stuff in New York was ill because it's Usher, but he's running around with Puff in the nineties. So so you run around with Puff. It's Little Kim around is big. Is Craig Mack around? This is this is this is. So when, you were around all this shit. I, yeah, I've seen some some wild stuff. Not not, <laughs> not 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 wild not wild in a bad way. Yeah. I, I should have said cool stuff. Like yeah, yeah. like you know, I was I was there for some things. I'm not wow. gonna embellish and act like I was around a whole bunch of stuff. Mm-hmm. But so, it, the stuff I was around w- was cool. Like Puff's office on 23rd Street, small office, probably about the size of this. Like, yeah. like, but to see that and then to see Homeboy grow into who he is, like it, right. it was, it was dope. Like to, to see that. Um, so, and then you just saw it as like, oh, this is just like, a, you know, this is a couple show gigs and then that's it. It's a wrap. I'm not gonna work with him again. Or yeah, well, um, you- so what? What happened was. 
maybe budget like to just it, there was no need for me at 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 a certain point. So then what happened is Toby, I think his name is Toby Rivers from La Face, mm -hmm. he would hire me to put the show tape together. So instead of me going on the road, I would get, yo, Mars, meet me in the studio. We're going to put the show tape together. Usher's opening for so-and-so. We want to still make sure that you get a check. Come to the studio. We'll put the show tape together. So I was involved um, from the outside on that on that stamp. So is this like around Make <coughs> make uh, make Me Wanna? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice and slow, uh -huh. that era. Um, and then I went, so I was doing that, and I was still in the clubs. So then, so you got the tour, then you got me producing some of his some of his early uh, um, tour performances. Then I'm in the clubs. Then, then from there, I get a call from Divine Stevens. I think it was, I think Monica was next. So, so then mm. I start to tour with Monica around the time whatever year so gone came out that was that was the album that i started to tour with monica so i'm touring with monica and then we do a show in daytona florida i believe it's like bt spring bling Kalisa's manager j ones comes up he's like yo what you doing for monica could you do can you do that same can you bring that same energy to Kalisa's show tour with Kalise. literally I, i'm not lying i'm in Prague, I think we were in Prague. Happened to check my emails because we didn't have smartphones back then. I'm checking my emails. Noonie from noontime. While I'm sitting in the lobby waiting for management to come down so we could, I think we were coming back to the States. Check my email. Noonie's like, yo, um, Sierra needs a DJ. And he says this phrase. I don't know if you do this, but do you <laughs> mind going on tour with Sierra? I'm already in Prague. like with <laughs> On tour. <laughs> but Khalees. I was like, Yes, because the Khalees, um run was was starting to slow down yeah, for a yeah. bit. Then I hop on with Sierra, do Sierra for three albums. Um, um, things change, and then Neo's people called me wow. and said, "Yo, you want to go on, on road like like almost back to back?" Um, I go on the road with Neo for three albums. Neo's um, situation changes. Then I go on with Carrie Hilson. Um, Still, still do stuff with Carrie to the day. Still, damn. still do stuff with Monica. So it was just back to back. Um, you were like the go to yeah. for, for, for R&B. You went yeah, from yeah, goodies to so sick and tired. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Carrie Hilson, <laughs> and then then Carrie Hilson to Keisha Cole. Um, all the, the DJs. Fuck? What it was was the women love you, man. What oh the man, fuck? and I love them too. <laughs> what it was is all the DJs were following. Like drama had set this crazy tone in Atlanta. Like it was drama, drama okay, with a drama. D, yeah. gangster grills. So all the DJs were following him. Like they were they were trying to do what he was doing. Right. That's all the mixtape stuff with yeah. Mark Cannon. And stuff. Um. So none, none of them were going after what I was going after because they all wanted to go on tour right. with the Jeezys of, of the world, right. right? So it left me it left me wide open. Right. Like So that's how I was able to You almost to had like no competition. None, because they weren't trying to do it. They, 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 he, was, he was uno nuno, that's it. Like there was <laughs> one. They, they weren't trying to do it. So it, it. Just think about it, right? Male masculinity, right? You, if you're thinking... All right, what energy do I want to be around? Yo, I want to be around the street shit, right? You're you're not thinking, you're not thinking to go after the R and B stuff, right? So yeah, they're just not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So so the visibility that I was getting from artist A is what attracted me to artist B to C D E and F. So wow. so it was working. God's plan was literally working for me, but the the other guys weren't trying to do it. They they were you know they was following another path so it just left it wide open Th thankfully yeah did you decline any artists like to talk I, there's artists I won't work with let's let's say that let's say that yeah so I I've, <laughs> I've definitely I'll bleep I, them if you want <laughs> I want to kind of know and I, once you say it you <laughs> can't <laughs> take the words back no 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 is there a reason you wouldn't want to work with these artists some artists just have bad business and you could you you could tell like you would do one show with them. 
And you'd be like, nah, nah, I can't mm. do this. And was they, it their label? Or was it because they're them. independent? It was, it was oh, because of them. It's, it was, the, it's maybe the way they they approach problems. Like, yeah. You know, like they just speak to you a little fucked up. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. You know, it's, it's how they handle They don't, don't want to collaborate. They just like, you know, they just want to like. Yeah, yeah some people just aren't good people. Just yeah. at, mm. at heart. And you see it. You, you know what I mean? Like, you, you see it. You, you've been around long enough, whether it's in the club or whatever. You, you know walking into a room. Uh, that, that room, that they're, just, room, they're lost in their ego. You know yeah, I mean? they just yeah. lost in that shit. Yeah, yeah like you, crazy. you know. So I've been blessed for you know the opportunities <laughs> that I have had. With, you know, all the artists that I name, like you know, cool experiences with them and, and no problems. Like shit, I DJ Nas and Kalisa's wedding. Like mm. that, I'll never forget that. Damn, you're yeah, like, bro. <laughs> <laughs> like, could you imagine that moment? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. like it was crazy. Like. It, but those moments are afforded to me by the relationships I had by, you know, being on the road with those artists. Do you remember what the song you played for their first dance? <laughs> Nas and... You, you know what's funny? I don't remember that, but what I remember... Oh, see, wait, he just talked about... He just talked about how he hates doing weddings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, I like, love that one. <laughs> but Nas and Khaleesi's like, yo, can you imagine? imagine how <laughs> Nas and Khaleesi's wedding. wedding. <laughs> yo, what I do remember, this is so fly, Nas is such a Queens hip-hop guy. Yeah, yeah. So... So the reception was in is in this big mansion, right? And you you walk out, you walk out of the house to the backyard. They got married in the fall, so it was kind of cool, temperature wise. And every it was at night, right? So there was like this makeshift like house in the backyard. And that's where the reception was. So you're walking from the house to the makeshift house, and you hear this um, band playing, and you're the doom 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 doom. doom Doom. It, you know, I'm a hip hop guy. So, oh, they're playing the um, um, they're playing the Heath Brothers. You know, the sample for One Love. Mm. You get closer, it's the damn Heath Brothers. Oh shit! That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Wow, like, yeah, yeah. It's the Heath Brothers playing with the xylophones and shit. Everything. Wow. I think it's called Hanging Billy Sweet. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the name. And of it's the super slow. Boom, 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 boom. 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 But it's the oh, Heath so brothers good. playing, and you know, <laughs> so I, I did the knowledge, did my homework. They're from Queens. Like, that's such a hip hop moment. It man. is. <laughs> the one wedding you did that was good. Yeah. The <laughs> I wish he remembered the first dance. I'm uh, so right. curious. Right. Oh, wait, I want to know two things. You know when they like introduce like yeah. You know, what, for, what did he for, come out to? Yeah, what did he come out? You know to I, the reception. Yo, I'm not even gonna lie, man. I don't and I don't even smoke. But I just I don't I don't remember that. Introducing for the first time, like they it come was, out to like MC Shan the Bridge or something. <laughs> <laughs> or, what's his name? Tomate Shante Jones, <laughs> Mister yeah, Jones. Jones. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy. Oh was, man, that you, night was ill. Man. You know, you, you forgot uh, one group that you. You DJed for who's that? I mean, I, I would think you would remember being in Atlanta. You DJed for one group. You were their first DJ. Supposedly. Oh man, yo, Outcast. Oh yo, before so, they signed with LaFace. That's right? a, that's so. Here's here's how that happened. Yeah. Right. We actually, I actually never did any shows with them. The plan was, my my friend Sean Johnson called me one day and was like, "Yo, I got these, I got these kids that I want you to meet." They're Really dope how, MCs. How old were they? You, you they were in high school. High school. Yeah, they, they were in high school. Young. They were they were in high school. Like still in high school, right? Um, got these kids. I want you to meet. I'm gonna take you over. They're, they're always at this house. Um, I don't even think he called it the dungeon. I don't. I don't remember if wow. he even referenced. Aka that. the dungeon family. He, he let's say he just said, "Yo, I'm gonna take you over my man Rico's house. Rico's one of the producers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just gonna take you over." So there organized so noise was there. Everybody, but, but I don't oh, know wow. their names. Right, right. right? So, so crazy. He is just like Sean is taking me to his man's house. Literally, that's what it is, right? And and he doesn't do much of much explaining. Like he, like I think he says, "Yo." Andre and Antoine. I think that's how he described them. I don't even think Big and Dre. I don't think he even said that. So we get to the house and you walk in, real old school Southern situation. Moms is cooking mm. in the kitchen. Hi, moms. You walk downstairs. <laughs> Someone's laying on the floor over there. Someone's laying on the floor right. over there. Someone's sitting on a couch over there. Someone's playing pool. And then over there where the where the equipment is, is um, Rico, Ray, and Pat organized noise, mm. right? I don't even remember where where Big and Dre was at the time, 
So he introduces me to Rico, Rico Wade. Rico is the predecessor to the RZA. He's literally the RZA, and I'm saying that just to give an example. Rico is the wizard, the RZA. We sat and talked for three hours about hip hop. We talked about everything from Africa Bambada to Luke. Like, wow. so I said, "Yo, these dudes, these dudes are dope. Like, their whole crew is dope." So then, um, Big and Dre start rhyming. They was dope from day one. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. MC, they were MCs. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? They weren't just rappers. No, they were MCs from <clears throat> day one. So the plan was for me to be their DJ. This is spring of, let's say it's spring of 93 or 94, before album came out. Um, I'm hanging out with them. This, me and Trauma are roommates at the time, right? They're at our house. Like, they had this song called On and On. Um, it didn't make the album, but like, so I'm, I'm hearing early outcasts right. before, before Atlanta even, because they were still in school. They were not signed at all. Summer, um, that semester is over. I go home for the summer out of touch, out of whatever the phrase is. I'm, I'm out the loop. Let's just say that. Um, I come back. They're signed to LaFace. Players Ball is a, is a single off the LaFace, right. uh, Christmas album. Mm-hmm. But by then, there was no way to find me. I'm in Massachusetts. I'm working on a turnpike. Um, they had to move on. So that's when they got Mr. DJ, who I think is Rico's cousin. They couldn't and get in contact with you. They didn't have your number? Or? Wow. I, I was like, out of mind. social media at the time. Yeah, no, like, no. Nah, nah, I mean, just, nah, you call the house, man. That's what he's just, but, I, yo. But, I mean, but, but, but he probably had his dorm room, and he he was out. He went home. Pager was probably cut off because I ain't paid a bill. Right. Whatever it was, out, out of sight, out of mind. But yeah. So I come back in the in the fall, they're signed, right? So that was when I said, I'm never leaving Atlanta because I was like, I can't. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> should have worked at the Waffle House, bro. <laughs> you know what? Did, did they apologize? They were like, "Yo, man, no, uh, no. apologize for what? You couldn't get in touch with me. They probably tried to page me. The number bounced back. It's like, oh, we'll move on." Okay, but- at the time, this is at the time you heard him for the first time, Ryan, mm-hmm. Big Boy, and Andre. Mm-hmm. Who did you think was meaner? It, it, they were both dope. Yo, now at that time, they were both. They no, were they, both nasty. I, I always yeah. think they're always equivalent, bro. Somebody always gives Andre the the up, but. I mean, at the time, you didn't really no, no, no. You didn't really start seeing uh, the difference between Andre and Big Boy till the second album. Yeah. Really, like the, the so, first album, they were both the, kind of like it was equal. They were like really on some like pimpalicious, yeah. like really laid back shit mm-hmm. with, Southern, with Players Ball, Southern Playlistic, Cadillac, Funky Music. The second album is when you started seeing Andre really like on elevators and all yeah. that shit really like yeah. kind of mm-hmm. step it up like oh shit yeah, yeah and go all the way all the way to the <laughs> left way I mean when yeah. you said when I was in the mall the other day heard a call from up the way yeah. yeah like yo to write like that but but I mean you can't take nothing away from Big either his pen game no, he's, is he's mean crazy with it mm-hmm. like but the the authenticity in that because you could close your eyes and you could see some goofy kid walking up to you right mm-hmm. like like that that bus line that he's talking about, the mall that he's talking about, that's so authentic. Um, so I don't know. People, I think people give big like because people always want to compare, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, run to DMC like they 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 always compare. Like you can't yeah. like someone, you can't like two people equally. I think Big sometimes gets the short end of the stick because he's nice. No, he's yeah. nice like, with it. He keeps up with Andre. Like, one of the few people that keep up with Andre when they rap like, together. Yo, in the first album, though, like, I would say I was a Big Boy fan more. Like, he was a little more pimpalicious. Mm-hmm. He had, like, a little bit more, like, a good one-liners, and he had, like, a little more style and cadence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, But, like, yo, even from that first video, Players Ball, I watched that video over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. They were they had so much style for Atlanta kids. Yeah, I that's mean, how I, Atlanta looked at that time. I mean, like, there, there was like an iconic like scene to me that looked so dope, and it was so cinematic when like Andre's playing pool with no shirt on, and he has a <laughs> and a, a Kango. Kango, and I was like, that's the coolest shit I've ever seen in my life. And they they were rocking the Atlanta Braves uh, yep. jerseys. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was like we were in New York, and we were like, yo, Atlanta's dope. Like, so, is this what Atlanta looks like? Is this if this is what they sound like? Atlanta's dope. We so I'm gonna give them. you some game to that. So yeah. Puff used to date this girl named Sarah that went to Clark with us, right? Mm. Right. So mm. I'm gonna tie all of this in. So Puff would be in Atlanta 
on a, on the regular, he would be in the A, right? And he's 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 probably still Puff Daddy at the time. You know his his names change, but at the time I think he was Puff Daddy. So he would be in the he would be in Atlanta and he would be in the clubs, right? There's a club that we used to do called Soho on Thursday nights. I felt like he was there every week studying in a great way. Like I'm not saying he right. was stealing, but he was studying. So so remember when you saw like big kind of rock that same Kango? Right. It was from Puff mm. studying that style in Atlanta because he was there. Like he was to his credit, like he got out of New York. Still super he's a super New York guy, but he got out of New York and he saw that and he took that back to big. Because if you look at the timeline, if you look at the timeline, that was in Atlanta. That energy in videos came from Outkast before it came from Big, mm. or, or the, around the same time. Puff but directed that video, right? Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. The um, damn, it was it was another one he directed. Um, it was filmed Freak Nick Weekend, right around the corner from where me and Trom used to live. I can't remember the, the name of the club, but all of that, all of that is because Puff was studying it. And like we saw it, like we didn't, no one viewed it as disrespect, but we saw it like, okay, he got that because that's how Atlanta cats would rock. Yeah. I mean, that was, Outcast was something else, man. Yeah. For, for like one of the groups to put Atlanta on a map like that, mm -hmm. that was the perfect group to do it. Like, yeah. That yeah. video, that song. Yeah. It, yeah. it just really. I mean, the albums alone, bro. Yeah. I mean, Equipment Night to me was a, a rap battle. It was not an album of like <laughs> that was a rap battle. Aquemini was a rap battle. Yeah, then then from that you get Goody Mob, like Organized Noise doesn't get the credit that I feel like they deserve in terms of their production. Like, did you see that documentary on Organized Noise? Of course. Of but course. how did it, it was really kind of heartbreaking. Right? Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Like the they've made all this amazing music and then that last Outcast album. It, it was just all this confusion, like unanswered Question, questions, yeah, and yeah. you could see the pain in his in Rico's yeah. in Rico's face, like in his and when he was speaking, like why would you why would you turn your back on us, like yeah, was, I I wasn't around like that, yeah, yeah, like yeah, that yeah. at that point, so I couldn't even I couldn't even add to any of the conversation, but I I know what that felt like for them when you when you look at Atlanta like uh, now or maybe even in the two thousand tens leading up to twenty twenties. What do you think is the biggest change that happened? Technology allowed for, and this is across the board, but specifically Atlanta, technology allowed for some people who weren't as talented to get in and and make their music. Not, you know, I, I have no no problem with people expressing themselves, but some of them weren't as talented, so but they figured out how to get in the door. So they get in the door, um, making making music and some of the backlash that people are throw at Atlanta, some of it is justified too. Like, you well, know, like what rap, backlash? Like mumble rap. Okay. Um, but don't, you know, those are kids just figuring it out for themselves, right? Through technology. Um, technology allowed them to get in the door without having to go through the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. So, so that era of, the nice MCs from Atlanta that we're talking about. Now the kid who who doesn't have to be nice, he can make himself popular because shit, he can make a record on his phone mm -hmm. and make a record and you know use Fruity Loops and make it in his bedroom and and put it out. So the gatekeepers aren't there, so the floodgates are wide open. So I think that's in part that's what kind of what we've seen across the board, but specifically to Atlanta. And do you think that affected nightlife and the club scene out there as well? No. Nah. Like, has the club scene changed as well? Yeah, so what, what I know happened I know, is, like I know like every time I hear a motherfucker DJ in Atlanta, they always talk about there's just too many hookah bars. Like there's too many Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, so did y'all just discover hookah bars? <laughs> no, nah, like nah. the past, maybe like the past 10 years. Yeah, he's talking, he's talking. Like the uh -oh. last 10 years, like it's just too much. Like no, everyone's just standing around a table and smoking hookah. Uh, yeah, okay. So yeah. What, what happened was the big clubs got so big that they gave birth to smaller clubs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then what I noticed, uh, what I noticed, I, this is around the Trinidad James era mm -hmm. because um, there were rooms that that I wasn't getting invited to to play at, but they were more influential. So those rooms, were, the smaller rooms, were more influential than the big clubs. And I noticed that the the more underground DJ, without necessarily the big name, 
he was nice, right? He was nice and his musical library was wider than mine, right? So I noticed that the smaller clubs started to be the influential clubs. The big clubs were like the, they were like the tourist destinations, but they weren't influential anymore because mm-hmm. it became bottle popping and, and, and all of that energy. But the smaller clubs, and I use Trinidad James uh, um, All Gold Everything for specifically because that record was filmed in, in one of those clubs that was changing for the better um, what Atlanta was about. So from a DJ standpoint, um, I'm looking at these smaller clubs are really where the all the new stuff is coming out of. Like they were coming out of that those smaller clubs. So um, I, I started to pay attention and book myself over there because that's where all the new energy was like the, the, the obviously this is after crime mob and scrapping and all of that this is like a new sound mm-hmm. but the new sound was was more influential those those bigger club I mean smaller clubs with the new sound was more influential than the big ones right so then you got the smaller clubs and then from the smaller clubs turned into lounges and that's when the hookah and whatnot started to come about mm. um so now everybody's sedentary. Everybody's in a club sitting down, smoking and whatnot. Um, but I, I won't blame it on the music. It just it was just that the smaller clubs became more popular, and then hookah nationally became like a national pastime yeah. in the in the clubs. It's, it's just one of those trends that you couldn't get away from. I want to know who brought that shit to Atlanta. Simon <laughs> Giddy one. <laughs> yeah, my man SG. He's one of what? the first. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, He yeah. fucked that whole shit up with that hookah shit. Yeah, he's my man, too. He's my, he's my man. That's that's my guy. He He's the one. He's the king of that, man. My man Simon. Yo, he he just created this whole fucking hookah disease that just went, went through all of nightlife in Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. Have. So it's, you know, it's, it's fun because I get to leave. Mm-hmm. And when I come back, it's fun when I go home, but it's definitely changed. You know, as a DJ, you you want 5,000 people in front of you. Like, you want that energy. I don't want the people coming in the club to sit on this couch to look at the person sitting on that couch looking at their phone. That's really what it is now. Like, yeah. that's, that's not challenging. So then, because the technology allows for that to happen, it allows for whack DJs to get booked too because the... The contest isn't how well you can keep 2,000 people on the floor because it ain't like that anymore. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. it's, it's pretty girls coming, sitting down and on their phone across from those pretty girls who are on their phone. Like it's not, that challenge isn't there anymore. Right, right, like right. I, I, I don't know what it's like in Vegas. I forget which club I heard you play at uh, Vegas, but you were getting busy. Like you were pushing the challenge, which was to make that room move. <laughs> it's not really like that. It's 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 funny though because uh, music doesn't call for any reaction right now. You're right. You know what I'm saying. So it's it's kind of hard. I would say in that scene, especially when the music coming out of Atlanta isn't doing that for the people of Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's still like Atlanta's still dominating hip hop to a certain degree. You know, yeah. like they're still killing it. Definitely. I think it's interesting when a DJ is humble enough to see that there's a, a new era of DJs coming up, and to be like, wow, they're better than me in a different way Mm -hmm. and I have to respect what they're doing and I I have to humble myself and like study them and learn from them you got to and 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 those are the DJs that that last 20 30 40 years Mm -hmm. because they adapt they're they're so open to adapt and to learn and they and they consistently approach the craft from like a student perspective of like yo this this kid is young Fuck that dude! Like I've been doing this, you know, however long. I, I know, know what, what the I'm fuck doing. I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but then, but just, but to see the young kid and be like, damn man, he's he, he knows what the fuck he's doing, and like yo, and showing love, supporting, going studying them, mm-hmm. and then you know yeah. they come into you for business, and you're asking them about music. It's like you know, it it takes a lot of humility to do that, but you get so much in return. But I think you doing that, and you know, you seeing that change around the Trinidad James times. That was it's very important to. To, to be aware of yourself and where you are and be like, wait, 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 I'm not in this scene. 
I have to get in the scene. You that know what scene I mean? was moving. Moving. And he's talking about like Migos, Trinidad yeah. James, yeah. Future. Future. Yeah. He's talking about all that shit coming out at once. Moving. From one movement. I credit my man DJ Scream, right? He, he, he um, from the east side, he was the one who was championing that scrappy crunk movement, right? Mm -hmm. So like so like he's the guy that I used to watch to understand what was going on out there. At the time, I'm fully grown. I'm I'm in my thirties. I don't know I, I couldn't even tell you at the time, I couldn't tell you the you know, what songs were popping off out there. I, I knew the high schools, I knew Reading In High, I knew South to Cab High, but I didn't know what those kids would listen to, but Scream did. So I got to pay attention to Scream because Scream inadvertently is going to teach me what's popping off out mm -hmm. there. Like, like you, you got to or else you're going to be the old man in the room. Like yeah, yeah. you're mm -hmm. going to be. Right now, my man DJ Cash, he is he's championing I'm a piano in, in uh, uh, Afrobeat, right? He's not the first, but he's the guy in Atlanta right now who's waving that flag heavy. He has a Tuesday night, Bomba Tuesdays. It's the best party in the city right now. It's one wow. of the best. Like, And it's him. He put that... He, put it on his back right. and now he's running with it. The Haitian cat from New York lives in Atlanta um, and he's running with it. He's targeting the the Africans in Atlanta. They are an untapped audience. I say this all the time. There's more Africans than there are African Americans. So you're a fool if you don't pay attention to that. Yep. Like, mm -hmm. and they got money, right? <laughs> not, not that it's all about money, but I'm saying like they are an influential group of people. Right. Like, mm -hmm. so I'm looking at um, Cash's IG the other day, brother spinning in Dubai. <laughs> Yep. Like without an artist, right. so would you, I'm gonna not pay attention to him. He's doing weddings out there <laughs> <laughs> with forty people. Yeah, forty people. He's like, damn, I might want to get back. Yeah, man. So my man DJ EU, Spanish cat, like he, yeah, we love like EU. Oh yeah, that's that's my guy. Like so, remember a couple years ago, I don't know the exact category, but I, I call it like Spanish dance music. Start whatever category you put Bad Bunny in. He was on that vibe early, yeah. right? And he and he's 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 waving the flag for it, like so. He's like the Latin DJ that's that standing alone holding that flag, mm -hmm. and he's moving. I gotta pay attention to him, like right. I gotta know those records, like. But I learn them from from him, right? And, and what I love about him is he's not letting that flag go, like. And this was before Bad Bunnies got popular. You know what I mean? Like, it was, this is before J Balvin got popular. Yeah. So he was ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. So you you, you got to pay attention and you got to respect it because those guys are, they are the future. They're, they're younger than me. So they're going to know stuff I don't know, but I, I got to pay attention to them. Yeah. It's, it's, it's weird. Like, when we see new things and we see like new shit popping, you know, sometimes we instantly, like, try to like be skeptical and hate mm -hmm. but i really try to change the energy to like curiosity mm -hmm. so like i always try to tell motherfuckers like when you see something new be more curious than skeptical yeah mm -hmm. and, and when you're curious you're kind of a little bit more open to receive mm -hmm. and when you're open to receive you can just kind of like you dig deeper you start understanding where it's coming from mm -hmm. and you, you know you go to the source and you learn more mm -hmm. but that yeah. you, you know what you're saying is absolutely right as you get older we don't want to be more and more skeptical. We want to be more curious. And it honestly yeah. keeps us all younger, man. Yeah, you know it, it keeps yeah. you. You got to, bro. So, Usher, we were in Paris two weeks ago. Oh, no, no, I'm lying. Last week, right? We were there for, for, week. For, th yeah. for three weeks at eight shows. So, my man, Ju DJ Just Dizzle from Paris, I, I hit him like, yo, let me know what's popping out there, right? So, it, it's him and there was a couple other DJs that I hit up because, um, I'm in a foreign country, number one. So I need to be tapped into what they're playing. Mm -hmm. So he put me on to a few artists that are incredible. This this girl, I'm going to mispronounce her name, Aya Nakamura. I think that's her name. She's mm -hmm. from Mali, African girl. Um, she has a song called Jaja. And I think the yeah. category is is Afro pop. I think that's what he said. The cat mm -hmm. is it's, it's Afro beat, but they call it Afro pop. Her song Jaja, part of my opening set, before Usher hit the stage yeah, yeah. was a staple in my set. 
Yo, I've, it's a big uh, record, big record. Yeah, she has almost a billion views on this. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say a million. I said Damn, she has nine hundred and thirty-six million views on a, from an artist I didn't hear of before I went over there. Really? Right. Wow. So, so if I was stuck on some, nah, we we, we just gonna be on some Atlanta kick. I wouldn't have open myself up to the knowledge to who this girl is. Mm -hmm. And she isn't the only one. She's just the name I remember off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, but to your point, it's opening up so you can right. so you can receive the information. Because now I know who's popping in Paris. She, I mean, she's popping outside of Paris. Yeah. The girl got almost a billion views <laughs> on one song. <laughs> <laughs> but you got to do that. You got you to set up shop in different countries and cities you got to be cool with the DJs and you like share share love, like share information, like what's popping in here when you're doing that, right? That's just something you kind of learned as you tour you every to. time, right? You 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 got to, or else I mean, you're really being a sucker. Like if if you don't, like it, it, part of how I got super cool with Bismarck because Bismarck would come to Atlanta and he would rock with all the DJs. Yeah. Like this is Bismarcky, yeah. <laughs> like you, you know what I'm saying. So mm -hmm. so like just studying guys like that. I, I mentioned him because he made it. He would always make himself available to guys in every market he went to. Now again, this is Bismarcky. I, I DJ Mars want to be friends with Bismarck. He wanted to be friends with us, like because that science that you're talking about right. about making your. He could have been on. Awesome. Yo, I'm Bismarck. I don't need to know nothing. They're gonna rock to what I play. He was not like that. Mm -hmm. He made himself open, yeah, and then yeah. in the process, you know. Obviously, he passed away, but great friends because of him saying, yo, I'm going to open myself up to these other guys. But you, you know, like the thing is, we all remember that, you know, like we remember like the DJs who like opened them, open, you know, themselves up to us and like embraced us, showed us around the city, showed love. And it like it literally makes us want to pass it forward, pay it forward and yeah. do it to the next motherfuckers that do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and 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 it's crazy because I'm seeing more of that nowadays from DJs than mm. I did from back in the day. Like I feel like the I don't maybe it's because we're on this podcast or whatever, but mm -hmm. everyone's been so like more generous and just open and like chill mm -hmm. than maybe like maybe 10 years ago or whatever. Like it was way that. more cutthroat. It was like yeah. motherfuckers yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying Same, like, go for self like, yeah, they, they're trying to eat your food and yeah. shit you know what I mean like you come into the town they're like <laughs> yeah. why this motherfucker's DJing instead of me I could be doing this shit <laughs> trying yeah. to eat your food and shit but, yeah. but now it's like it's a little more it's a little more cool yeah. it's, it's gotta be that's how you win yeah you, you know what I'm saying like the, we've all seen the meme like the collaboration is a new competition like it, it makes sense so all right, so I'm DJing at the after parties with him. It's it's his club. Be clear. It's not my club. It's, 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 it's <laughs> not my club. He owns it on the low. But, 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 but you know what I'm it. saying? Like you, that, you know what's funny? Because he tells us it's his club yeah. like when we're alone. <laughs> <laughs> He's being coy yeah. now. You remember, the, remember the scene in uh, Lion King where he tells <laughs> so everything is ours? That's what he tells me. It's full of shit, Stay man. away from the dark side over there. But what I'm saying, like, like, like first met him, Open arms, yeah. like right. So, so that allowed for me and him to be able to rock together to spend essentially now is two years, right? Mm -hmm. So then, so me and him rocking together, we're rocking in a club, and then somebody suggests that I do the podcast. If let's say if I was an asshole to him, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be here right now, being able to tell my story. Mm -hmm. But because me and him, we we linked and we and we rocked. This is the collaboration because to your point, people are opening up and people are are saying, yo, listen, man, I need to rock with this guy. He got that over there. He got that over here. She got that over there. Right. Let's let's rock. Yeah. Instead of me being on some, yo, son, it's time for me to get on. I'm here with Usher. He know I would come in the booth. Oh, my God, <laughs> You'd be you don't have to get off. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. You could no, be the star right now. It's so funny. One night, me and him we went back to back, like two, like during the whole night, he was like, yo, I don't feel like doing the night by myself, myself man. You want to do two for two? And I'm like, I was like, I thought He's I was going like, to have the night off. Home. But I was just like, you know what, man? Fuck it. Let's do it, man. But he, I mean, he understood. He understood like, man, yo, them two hours before us hit that stage. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, I didn't realize that's a long night for you. Yeah, I thought it was it really like a thirty-five, a forty-five. It, it, like it, it's it's a long, and then then I do the show 
so it's not like I just spin, he comes on stage and I disappear. No, like I have a set in the show as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and then go do the after party. Uh, so it's a dope ass experience, man. It's They're dope. making you work yeah. for that dollar, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're making you work. I'm like, you got here from this to this. So, I, But I didn't realize you literally stay in yeah. Vegas for like three months with for the show. Man, yeah, listen. I've been, for the last two years, I've been in Vegas almost as long as I've been in Atlanta in terms of, like, like where I'm staying now, it'd be like an eight-week stretch and go home for a week and then come back another eight weeks. I didn't realize that. You stayed in the hotel the whole time? Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. damn. Shit. I oh, think you got a spot by now. <laughs> <laughs> now I, where, we, where they got us at um, is dope, man. I got, I got wash and dry in my room. I got a kitchen in my room. So all that sexy going out to these thousand dollar plate restaurants, whatever. <laughs> I feel like, yeah, man, you've been this here, this whole time, man, we, we could have taken you to some spots to eat. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Y'all still yeah. could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, don't say it like it's past he, 10. He just, good, friend. he just go to best friend in Italy. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, He's like, he knows the cook. He's like, you know. Yeah. You know what I mean, we could have had him on the podcast sooner if yeah. I knew this. Yeah. I, thought hey, you, I, thought, I literally thought you were flying back from Atlanta. Yeah, oh, so we, that's we, I thought that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, nah, no, nah, we, we yo, it, that would kill us. That would yeah. that would kill me. Like like, you you all know everybody travels. Yo, that traveling wears you down. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. especially at airport in Atlanta. That shit is rough. Shit. It's not as bad as people <laughs> nah, say. No, nah, that motherfucker is a whole country. <laughs> Yo, that Atlanta airport is the worst. Yo, that no, shit it's is really. That's uh, like a subway. That shit is hell. The Man. Atlanta airport is the worst. No, it's not. It's, 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 it's the worst. <laughs> you just got the hookup, so you get the back door. From your side. Nah, that shit is the worst. I fly Delta every time. <laughs> Me I, like, too. I have to. I have a layover in Atlanta. I'm like, oh, Jesus it takes Christ. the connecting part. It's the, the fucking burn. worst, man. Yeah. So it. what makes it so bad? Let me. I, uh, it's big as shit. Boss. The few times that I've actually had to DJ in Atlanta and mm. I had to go to the airport, I'm uh-huh. like, I have to prepare like three hours. Head. Some <laughs> shit's gone. This is before clear though and all that, uh, so I don't know yeah. if it's better. Mm-hmm. But like, yo, it would. I was like, Atlanta's fucking hell. This is hell. Yeah, you get in the wrong line at the wrong <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah, you're gonna miss your flight. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it all the way it's funky. Fucking horrible. You. What clubs did you play at in A? It was like opera. opera. Opera was a dope club. Opera. This is when they were like EDM, and then they be- became mm. hip hop. I remember I, I went there. They were like EDM, mm. and then the second time I'm like thinking, oh, okay, EDM. And they're like, no, we're a little more hip hop now. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, this shit is changing. And what's it, it like, like out here now in the in the big rooms? Is it all EDM? What's what's it like? It's like this weird mix of um, EDM tech house remixes mm-hmm. and like and hip hop and okay. then like reggaeton and like top forty shit. Yeah, but it's like everything is like mostly like EDM. Like it's like an EDM remix of like oh, if, instead of playing like a Taylor Swift song that would go off. It's like playing an EDM remix of a Taylor Swift song. Got big it. room remix. Yeah, yeah. But there's also just uh yeah, it's just it's big room shit. Big room Vegas shit. Yeah, big room. But man. as I travel around in different cities, like this is the only one of the only cities that's kind of playing like this. Mm. Like that's still holding on to, to some the of the EDM. To some of these EDM remixes. Like mm-hmm. uh a little more than other cities, I would say. What do you think so, changed it? I think, you know, people, I think there's a stop. formula for bottle service. And I think it. I think it still works with mm-hmm. all the theatrics of like mm-hmm. cryo yeah. and everything. Um, but I, f- I feel like there's a trans. I feel like you know Vegas is in a semi transitional period, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a little bit, just mm-hmm. because after the pandemic, it, everyone was so happy to get out. Mm-hmm. But now it's just like I feel like there's a little bit of a change coming through. Mm-hmm. Uh, Definitely we'll by, by next year, I think we'll see. Well, I think it'll take a couple years, but Prayers. I think next year, man. Well, Not the thing is, prayer. the thing I've been I've been hearing about weed lounges. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So like I'm I'm curious to see what happens. And how the weed lounges affect everything going on. Mm-hmm. Because some of these weed lounges are gonna have like casino budgets. Mm. So it's I'm wow. curious to see what they do. They're gonna be the new hookah bars. Mm. Well yeah. <laughs> but it's I mean it'll be a completely different vibe, mm. but I'm just kind of curious to see like how much it spreads the nightlife thin on mm. the strip. Mm. You know what I'm saying? You think, you think it'll take away from the strip audience? I think there's a um I think there's a majority of people that want that are going to be curious to check out the weed lounges, mm-hmm. see what the experience is like, mm-hmm. yeah. and especially if they have the budget and they they can mix like you know if you could drink, eat, and do all that shit there, mm-hmm. you could buy the weed from there. Yeah, buy the weed, yeah. smoke in there. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> they're about to kill it. Oh, girl, yeah. rolling your own J's, you know. But I'm, I'm sure there's going to be different kinds of weed lounges. There's going to be weed lounges that do like yoga. 
<laughs> like, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like weird but, shit. Yeah. Smoke weed, do yoga, like all this other shit that's like that's more, you know, <laughs> yeah, spiritual. Not, and then uh-huh, there's yeah. going to be some turn up. There's going to be some sexy shit. I think it's just going to be all different, mm-hmm. you know. But I'm just, I'm curious to see how the city evolves mm-hmm. uh, from that, you know. But I'm, yo, know, like now that you're here, we got to take you out to some spots. Yeah, man. Stuff. Yeah, I, I don't like eating on the strip. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't like eating. That's we, a bunch we don't of good either. spots. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of cool spots in Chinatown. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Nah, I'm down, man. Yo, I'm I, definitely down. I, I'm so happy that we finally got you on. Yeah, on man. The podcast. D- dope DJ talk. Like, like I was saying, um, me and you and Eddie was talking earlier. Yeah, yeah. I see the, I see the podcast, and when I walk in, I said, "Yo, the conversations are legitimately dope. Like uh-huh. they're, they're super, super dope. Like a lot of times people don't get to talk to us." Right, because we're yeah. in the clubs playing, so you can't. But to be able to watch what you guys do and allow DJs to tell their story, give their opinion, give their two cents on their career, whether it's a big name or a small name, whatever. Everyone has experience, so it's dope watching this thing grow, man. Oh, I appreciate it. I always, I always say it's like you know, it's like we just finished the gig and we got food after. <laughs> yeah, we're just yeah. kicking it and we're yeah. just talking about like. Just like crazy DJ, shit. Like, yeah, DJ, yeah. DJ, mm-hmm. DJ, like late night diner talk. You know, I already what I'm saying? know. Yeah, I already know. Yo, <laughs> DJ Mars, thanks for coming through. Yeah, man. Yes, sir. That was, thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you. If you want to watch more episodes from Road Podcast, click either links on the left or the right. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page and get updated on new uploads throughout the week. Peace. Yeah.